welcome today for this forum on why and which uh, manufacturing matters. So first of all, I just want to thank my colleagues, uh, Mark Miro and Howard Weil, uh, for their leadership and their scholarship on this important topic, which has brought us to today. Uh, the timing of this forum uh, could not be more propitious. The severity of the recession, uh, the sluggishness of the recovery are triggering a re robust and, frankly, a long overdue debate in the country about the future of manufacturing. It's happening, obviously, not only in op-eds and blogs and editorials from some of the most eminent economists in the country. Uh, Christina Romer and Laura Tyson recently had pieces in the New York Times. Uh, Jared Bernstein had a blog earlier this week. But we also have Rob and Howard and Sue and other folks here today. But also we have CEOs of major global production companies. Uh, Jeff Immelt of GE, Andrew Laveris of Dow Chemical, uh, Boeing, They've been particularly forceful in articulating the need for national manufacturing policy to build off the strong base we already have in the United States. So three things I want to highlight at the beginning. As you will hear today, there's a lot at stake in this debate as the U.S. struggles to not just create more jobs, but better jobs and retool our economy in the aftermath of the recession. As Howard and Sue Helper will demonstrate, Manufacturing is a special sector because it delivers quality jobs, fuels innovation, drives exports, reduces the trade deficit, enables the United States to be at the vanguard of the clean tech revolution. A country that produces more innovates more. A country that produces less, frankly, should worry about its long-term prospects. Second, it is essential post-recession that the U.S. develops and implements a national manufacturing strategy. I use the word national rather than federal deliberately because all levels of government play critical roles in supporting, buttressing, leveraging manufacturing. The federal role is obvious. Given the impact of trade, tax, and currency levels on manufacturing and given the range of federal government investments in innovation, human capital, and infrastructure, but the states have broad powers over such market-shaping policy, market policy areas as infrastructure, innovation, energy, education, and skills training. And cities and metro areas are critical because they house the institutions that actually do the work, manufacturing firms, large and small, trade associations, our air, rail, and seaports, advanced research institutions, community colleges, high schools that provide career and technical services, so forth and so on. Manufacturing strategy is a federalist act done in close collaboration with the private sector and supporting civic institutions, and the presence of Connect today is a testament to the profound role that's played by local metropolitan and regional intermediaries. And finally, this is the first in a series of forums and reports on manufacturing that Brookings Metro intends to hold uh, this spring and summer. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I'll be in Michigan for the release of a state urban and metropolitan strategy that capitalizes on the manufacturing assets of that state as a platform for future growth and renewal. On March 8th, back in this room, uh, we'll release our report called Export Nation which will reveal how manufacturing is driving metropolitan and national growth post-recession. On May 3rd, uh, Howard will return uh, with the spatial geography of manufacturing, which will unveil the concentration of the nation's productive assets, very distinct productive assets, in different metros around the country. And then in a series of forums as part of a Global Cities Initiative, we will look at the links between manufacturing, exports, and skilled workers in L.A. in March, Ohio in May, and Florida in June. Um, we're also embarking with McKinsey on some very exciting work on drilling down on the full federal, state, and local policy agendas for two advanced industries in two dramatically different states, and that will show the very nature of the federalist task facing two different industries in different places. So in sum, our intent here is to undergird the manufacturing debate and policy action with evidence not only about manufacturing performance, but the distinct manufacturing assets of different metros and their states. 
And looking forward to the discussion today, Howard and Sue's presentation, the, the panels to follow. Um, I encourage everyone to engage on Twitter as well with me, uh, Mark Muro, Brookings Metro, hashtag USMFG. Uh, let me start by introducing Peter Cowie uh, to give a few remarks. He's the UC San Diego Dean and Qualcomm Professor of Communications and Technology Policy at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. He's the chair of the Connect Innovation Institute, and in 2009, he served as the senior counselor for policy planning to U.S. Trade Representative Ron Kirk. He's been absolutely critical in helping position UCSD as a true metropolitan leader and national model of metropolitan leadership from the university sector on the productive economy, working closely with the private sector from idea generation to tech transfer and commercialization in advanced electronics, medical technology, energy, biopharma, and more. Peter, thanks for coming. Well, thanks, Bruce, very much for both being a gracious host today to the Connect Innovation Institute project and a wonderful partner in thinking about the future of innovation and production and employment possibilities in the United States. As you hear the discussion unfold today, uh, especially from the participants from the Connect project, I hope that you'll walk away with four headlines in your mind. Here's the first headline. The fact that the largest technology organization in Southern California, one of the bastions of high-tech innovation, cared enough about the problem of production and employment in the United States to mount a major project with the support of the founder of Gateway Computers and with the presence of Erwin Jacobs, the co-founder and former CEO of Qualcomm. That in itself is a message that should matter in Washington. Here's the second headline you should think about. The public discussion about innovation in the United States and its implications for growth confuses two types of innovation systems that coexist in the American economy. The first type of innovation system is what we call novel product innovation. It's knowledge intensive, high value added innovation. It's Qualcomm's breakthrough chip technologies. It's protease inhibitors. It's nanomaterials. And in that system of innovation, the United States remains the world's best because of a combination of both entrepreneurial markets and appropriate public policy to support the innovation system. We have to constantly revisit to deal with competitive challenges, but that system is fundamentally sound in its core if we maintain it. The second type of innovation system, however, is incremental product and process innovation. Think of that as an automobile transmission for most of your cars. Fundamentally, that technology is the same as it was 50 years ago at its core, but in terms of its features and productivity, enormously greater because of continuous incremental innovation and process production innovation that makes those features affordable, even as they are added upon. That system of innovation in the United States lags even against other high-wage industrial countries and that should be source of concern to the United States. Here's the third headline. Both of those very type, different types of innovation share the same four fundamental building blocks. And we get those building blocks right for novel product innovation, and we don't get them so right for incremental product and process innovation. Let me illustrate the four building blocks with the more familiar field of high-tech technology products. Number one, shared production assets. If you go to San Diego, the smallest startup firm in biotech or electronics, et cetera, can have available to them the most state-of-the-art electron microscopes and mass spectrometers because within the cluster, anchored by the research university, but with the help of organizations like Connect, there is an efficient system for sharing those key scientific assets so you don't have to buy them to use them in your early stages of growth. Rental, sharing, a whole series of solutions exist to share key production assets. Number two, there is an effective networking institutional structure. 
We all know that innovation is about people and ideas, and the circulation of people of, and ideas while respecting intellectual property. A good innovation cluster encourages that circulation and networking. But it's not just about sharing ideas and sharing people and getting them to move around. It's about building trust and cooperation inside the cluster so that, for lack of a better term, handshake deals are possible at early stages to try things out informally with cooperation among many, leading later to the complex contractual maze that we all have to live through when things scale up. The third feature of a successful innovation system as a building block is the ability to launch innovative business models. What do we mean by that? Think of the iPod. Before the iPod was introduced, the conventional wisdom in the business press was that content was king and where profit was to be made, hardware was a commodity. Steve Jobs understood that maybe you could invert that proposition. A slick piece of hardware integrated to a new service called a store could make the profit on the hardware and commoditize the content and thus revolutionize an entire industry. That is an innovative business model and that is possible due to a combination of public policy, professional services that support innovators and a larger permissive environment that spawns that type of creative thinking. And the fourth feature of a successful innovation group and cluster is really the ability to have appropriate specialized financial institutions. America reinvented its innovation system in light of the Japanese challenge around small startup companies that eventually became giants like Qualcomm. Those companies were supported by a novel financial system that we called venture capital. But venture capitalists did not drop from God or even from Wall Street. They occurred both in response to a need and in response to public policy innovations, such as the Securities and Exchange Commission saying to pension funds that they could put part of their portfolio into high-risk venture investments through venture capitalists. Those four building blocks we would submit are lagging as a set of building blocks for incremental product and process innovation in America. And here's the fourth headline we hope that you'll walk away with, which is the way we got the novel product innovation system and its policies right was by experimentation at the national, local, state, and regional level. Call them technology clusters that evolved. And the remarkable thing about that is that this policy ecosystem supporting an innovations ecosystem is supported broadly in both blue states and red states. It is not a Democratic or a Republican state administration priority. Go to the Southern Governors Association, they support it. Go to California, California supports it. The same type of approach at a federalist level combining local initiative with federal support could help rebuild a bipartisan basis for the innovation system in ecology for incremental product and process innovation. As you hear my panelists today lay out, the studies that we've put together, and that includes Sue Helper in her crossover role between the two projects. We are going to be delighted to ask, answer your questions, and we hope contribute to this dialogue that Brookings has been such a trailblazer in. Thank you very much. Manufacturing policy is the subject of great current controversy. Former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Christina Romer, recently wrote in a New York Times op-ed that a persuasive case for a manufacturing policy remains to be made. Well, today, we'd like to make that case. Our discussion proceeds in three parts. First, we'll review why manufacturing matters. Second, we'll talk about which kinds of manufacturing matters, and in that way uh, we build upon uh, other work that has been done, but uh, uh, 
we talk about which manufacturing matters because not all manufacturing matters equally. Different firms uh, different with different business strategies, different industries matter differently uh, for the achievement of important national policy goals. And finally, uh, we'll lay out a policy framework for thinking about um, a national, federal, state, and local integrated manufacturing policy. So why manufacturing matters? Well, between the beginning of 2001 and the end of 2009, the nation lost uh, nearly 6 million manufacturing jobs. Uh, since December 2009, uh, it's regained somewhat more than 300,000. Now, it's possible that that small increase in the number of manufacturing jobs is just a bounce back of demand from the recession, but we actually think that there's reason to believe that it could be some, the beginning of something longer lasting. The era of mass offshoring is probably coming to an end. Wages in China are rising faster than productivity. There's been a slight increase in the value of the Chinese yuan. Of course, it's still manipulated, and it shouldn't be. Uh, but things have been moving very, very slowly in the right direction. A wide range of manufacturers, including such prominent ones as GE and Ford, are beginning to reconsider the costs as well as the benefits of offshoring, and some companies are bringing work back to the United States. And finally, the current natural gas boom has been boosting demand for uh, products uh, such as chemicals and machinery needed to extract natural gas. So for all those reasons, we think that uh, we could be at the beginning of a manufacturing job renaissance but we won't be without the right kinds of policy. The bounce back of manufacturing jobs will remain just a trickle uh, without a more robust federal manufacturing policy. And moreover, the recent bounce back of manufacturing jobs has been accompanied by a disturbing uh, decline in manufacturing wages, which has contributed uh, to some extent to the growth of manufacturing jobs recently, uh, but of course uh, at the expense of manufacturing wor workers and uh, more broadly the nation's standard of living. Uh, so m manufacturing policy is needed to address the wage problem in manufacturing as well as to uh, spur more robust job growth. Manufacturing matters for several reasons. Uh, manufacturing embodies the virtues of a rebalanced and more productive next economy, where we think the uh, national economy should be going um, over the course of the next business cycle upswing. Uh, manufacturing offers high wage jobs, thereby providing opportunity to a wide range of workers. It contributes disproportionately to innovation. It's the key to reducing the trade deficit, thereby creating an economy that is more oriented towards exports and less dependent on imports than our current economy. And finally, it contributes to environmental sustainability, and particularly uh, through the reduction of carbon emissions. Even after controlling for all the worker and job characteristics that influence wages, manufacturing still pays higher wages to workers at a variety of uh, educational levels. It pays about 7% more to workers with just a high school diploma and to workers with at least a bachelor's degree and a bit more than that uh, to workers with some college. So if you move a worker from another industry to manufacturing on average, uh, that worker will get uh, about a 7% uh, wage increase if they're in one of these educational categories. Manufacturing is the major source of commercial innovation. More than two-thirds of domestic R&D spending by companies uh, happens in manufacturing firms. Um, about 18% of all that spending happens in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, about 10% in transportation equipment, including autos and auto parts, aerospace, uh, shipbuilding, and other areas. And about 14% combined occurs in the computers and electronics area uh, which includes communications equipment. And moreover, the kinds of incremental product and process innovation that Peter mentioned are also areas in which manufacturing, though in need of improvement, still excels relative to other parts of the economy. It's a common, um, recently a very commonly repeated myth that innovation in manufacturing 
uh, is the cause of manufacturing job loss. If you compare the 1990s with the pre-recession part of the first decade of this century, the period 2000 to 2007, you see that annual growth and productivity was about the same in those two periods. But annual job loss in manufacturing was much, much greater in the 2000s than in the 90s. So clearly there's no uh, necessary or no empirical relationship between uh, manufacturing job loss and productivity growth in manufacturing. So don't blame uh, productivity growth for manufacturing job loss. Um, yeah. Manufacturing is essential for reducing the trade deficit uh, because nearly two-thirds of all U.S. trade, imports and exports combined, uh, is due to manufacturing. If we're going to reduce imports by bringing work back uh, from other countries and increase exports, manufacturing is going to be a key to doing that. It's not literally impossible to do it without manufacturing, but it's much, much easier to do it with manufacturing, particularly if we want to avoid a very, very large uh, devaluation of the dollar and its consequent uh, uh, results for our standard of living. Manufacturing is a huge contributor to environmental sustainability. My Brookings colleagues last year released a report on the clean economy. Jobs in the clean economy are those that produce goods and services with an environmental benefit or that add value to those goods and services. And my colleagues found that the clean economy is nearly three times as manufacturing intensive as the broader U.S. economy. That is, manufacturing accounts for about three times the share of jobs in the clean economy as it does in the U.S. economy as a whole. So manufacturing is at the forefront of the development of a low-carbon economy. Uh, and that's not only because renewable energy components like solar panels and wind turbines and advanced batteries uh, are manufactured products, but also because a whole range of manufactured products are needed to retrofit buildings uh, to make them uh, less um, energy using. So which manufacturing matters? The manufacturing sector is quite heterogeneous. We think about which manufacturing matters in two parts. Industries matter. Some industries have greater potential to contribute to broad national goals, such as the ones that we've outlined here today, uh, than others do. And firms and their business <laughs> strategies matter as well. Which kinds of industries are the ones in which the US has the greatest potential to retain or expand jobs? Well, one kind is uh, fairly widely talked about, high-wage manufacturing industries. High-wage industries are either high-tech, high-skill industries, such as pharmaceuticals and computers and electronics, or very capital-intensive industries, uh, such as uh, autos and petroleum and coal products. But we shouldn't also forget about manufacturing industries where transportation costs are an important part of total costs. Those are also industries in which we're likely to retain or expand jobs. Those are industries where products are heavy uh, in relation to their value. Uh, such prosaic industries as wood and paper and food and beverages. Uh, in those industries, production has to occur relatively close to consumers. And finally, over the last couple of years, there's been job growth in a variety of middle wage durable goods manufacturing industries, and as we said before, I think there's reason for that to uh, continue in the future. We point to four industries in particular that make particularly large contributions to critical national goals. Chemicals, a category that includes pharmaceuticals, transportation equipment, as we mentioned before, including autos, auto parts, aerospace, shipbuilding, and others, machinery, and computers and electronics, uh, a category that also includes communications equipment and many medical devices. All four of those industries pay wages that are above the manufacturing average. If we look here on this slide, we see um, average weekly wages, again, controlling for all other factors that influence wages. Those four industries are the four that contribute the largest shares of commercially funded 
uh, R&D in the manufacturing sector. Three of the four industries, uh, chemicals, transportation equipment, and machinery, have had a positive change in their trade balance over the course of the last decade. So they've been moving in the right direction, <laughs> while manufacturing as a whole uh, has not. And finally, transportation equipment, machinery, and computers have been gaining jobs over the last couple of years. And I will now turn the podium over to my co-author, Sue Helper, who will talk about why firms, not just industries, matter. Great. So uh, Howard has talked to us about uh, kind of why manufacturing matters overall, in that on average, manufacturing makes important contributions to national goals in the areas of innovation, wages, the trade deficit, and the clean economy. And then he's gone on to show that particular industries make outsized contributions in these areas. And I want to uh, argue that even within particular industries, certain production models have uh, the opportunity to make these great contributions, uh, even within some of the industries we think of as old industries. Um, so what do I mean by this, these uh, production strategies? So the one I want to, one I, distinction I want to talk about is sort of between high road and low road. And so in a high road, uh, strat a high road production strategy, uh, firms are going to, it's basically a win-win-win strategy, where firms are able to uh, create high productivity because they're harnessing the knowledge of all their workers, not just the, you know, smart PhDs at the top or MBAs at the top, but everyone. Um, and to that model, a uh, well-trained and a, and thus highly paid workforce is key to generating productivity in a way that I'll show. Um, and so these firms then compete principally on quality and innovation. And that model then contrasts with what we might call low road model, where we have companies in supply chains and basically what they're trying to do is profit by squeezing those below them. Uh, and so they're competing rather than by kind of trying, the, rather than by expanding a pie, by uh, shifting costs to others. So a small pie, let's grab my share, uh, it doesn't matter if the way I'm competing is imposing uh, safety costs on workers or environmental costs on communities. Uh, I'm going to get my profits. Um, I want to give a particular example within the automotive stamping industry. Um, this is one of a number of industries I could have chosen. Uh, so just to stress, that's an example. Um, and this industry, like a number of others, is I think shows the connections between this incremental innovation system and the novel innovation system that uh, Peter started with. So in automotive stamping, uh, firms take pieces of metal and bang on them with huge presses, sometimes the size of this room, to create everything from car doors to, uh, say, metal cup holders. Um, it's an old industry. It's been around for a long time. On the other hand, there's a huge opportunity for innovation here, both on the process side. You go to innovative firms in this area, and you see uh, robots. You see se advanced sensors that can tell you what's going on in that press. You see also on the materials side, ability of using uh, high-strength steel, um, even non-metallic metals to run through this press, and, you, and there's discussions of metallurgy at the metallic level that goes on in these industries. Um, and so there's, uh, that's kind of the high road firms. Uh, the top 10% in this, uh, some data that I collected with some colleagues at Case Western on the auto supply chain, the top 10% of these firms getting a value added per worker of a, almost $100,000. The very most recent data where these firms have recovered more from the recession suggests that the top 10% of these firms are more at $150,000 value added per worker. This takes us up to the level of some of what we think of as the really high tech uh, firms. If we think about what does $150,000 value added per worker mean, um, well, if you think about sort of paying somebody um, at a uh, living wage or even a $20 an hour wage, uh, we're talking maybe $40,000, $50,000 there. But if you're making $150,000 per worker, that's plenty of money left over for capital investment for profits. 
uh, whereas these low firms, the firms in the bottom 10 percentile, $30,000. Even if you took all that money and paid the worker with it, it's not a great wage. Um, so um, what this slide shows is that those firms, uh, these same firms, so the firm at the $99,000 value added per worker, their production workers are making $17 an hour on average. Uh, one thing I should also say is that these workers are likely to be getting benefits that would increase their total compensation a lot, um, health benefits, retirement benefits, et cetera, whereas in the low road, they're making uh, $11 an hour. So how is it that we have the same job classification and we have differences of 50%? What is it that these workers do that's different? Um, so one is if we want to... Uh, think about how are we going to introduce these new innovations? How are we going to get in high strength steel um, that requires uh, new design practices, new ways uh, that high strength steel, for example, is thinner and more brittle. It can tear in the press. It can have a problem of what's called springback, where it wants to retain its shape. So uh, groups of workers can form, th uh, uh, form quality circles. This is a uh, Japanese innovation. Um, that uh, it's been known for 20, 30 years in the U.S., getting groups of workers, so ranging from the person who's tending this machine, but knows its qualities, its problems, what happens when you actually try to run that piece of metal through that particular press, interacting with skilled tradespeople, uh, engineers, et cetera, solving problems uh, so they can both reduce, rev uh, reduce defects, so they can reduce costs, can also increase revenue by uh, enabling the introduction of higher tech products and introducing those products more quickly. Uh, and so as you can see, uh, firms that did this recovered more quickly. This is again data from the Case Western survey of automotive suppliers uh, that we conducted last year. Uh, those firms that had these practices saw a small increase in sales. Those that did not um, uh, st are still uh, down, uh, almost 10% in sales compared to 2007. A similar process, a practice that kind of links this incremental improvement economy with the ability to innovate to introduce new products is preventive maintenance, basically knowing that your machines are going to be up at all times. Um, so firms take different paths to the high road, but uh, I think the, the advantages are shared by workers and managers and also communities. You may think, well, geez, how can you pay 50% higher wages to your direct labor and, and make any kind of profit? And a, a key here is that if you pay 50% higher wages, that doesn't mean your costs go up by 50%. Direct labor is a very small part of uh, total cost in a modern manufacturing system. Supply chains are very important. So the key costs are actually in the supply chain and purchase parts. So 65% is a typical number is in purchase parts. So if you have a worker who you know is going to uh, make sure there are no defects, make sure that the presses are up and running, that your capital is uh, working for you at all the times, that worker can, in some sense, save you money and is worth w far more to you than that small increment in the wage. Uh, however, sort of despite these advantages, we um, often don't see a lot of firms on the, on the high road. Why not? Uh, two reasons. The first one is what economists call complementarities, that certain uh, of these investments don't pay off unless several are made nearly simultaneously. Many of these firms are quite small, so the median firm that responded to our survey is uh, about 100 workers. Uh, a quarter of the employment in the auto supply chain is in firms with less than 500 workers. You have a manager there who's, you know, not only the uh, salesperson but the R&D person and the HR manager. Uh, so if you, if you think about um, problems within a firm, uh, there's a technique called agile production where you're introducing new products all the time. Uh, you can make a great variety of products. Uh, there's a firm, a Cardinal Fastener, and outside of Cleveland that can ship a U.S. Fastener uh, anywhere uh, within most of the country within 24 hours. They can set up, they can run it. What enables them to do that was well, simultaneous coordinated investments. Uh, so they have the equipment that's flexible, computer controlled, they can change it over quickly. They can market that they actually have this capability that you, know, you can call them up and uh, 
they, they will uh, solve your problem for you. The IT that schedules this from their website to the shop floor. Uh, but then the HR is also very key. You have workers that don't just watch machines, they set up and run the machines. They make improvements to the future production. Uh, you can also see these complementarities uh, within a supply chain. So I mentioned these new materials. This is a really important way that we could be reducing our fuel consumption. Every 10% reduction in the weight of a car can cut fuel consumption between 6 and 8%. Um, but in order to do that, you need to design differently. So for high-strength steel, it's not high-strength unless it's stretched. So that means the design has to actually have embosses and uh, various kinds of uh, lines that, that make sure the steel gets stretched in the press. It means different design practices. It means different tooling. Um, it needs different production processes in the stamping firm. All these are now done by separate firms, and so the coordination needs to happen and is actually uh, problematic uh, right now. A second big issue is externalities, which is the firm owners that are trying to decide to make these investments or not, they don't capture all the benefits. They, high wages uh, are a big benefit to workers, but that's not captured in the decision making of a uh, profit maximizing firm. So um, moving on from kind of why manufacturing matters and in particular which manufacturing matters, we want to say uh, the particular industries that Howard discussed, and also these particular firms in regards of industries that are using these high road techniques. So how do we get there? Uh, so we think uh, manufacturing policy should address four major challenges. We might think of these as market failures in economist speak. Um, so we want to support R&D, need to uh, improve access to finance, need lifelong training of workers, and uh, finally, strategic investments with high returns to workers and communities. Um, we want to illustrate how this can happen, not that we need to slavishly, in illustrate, slavishly imitate anybody, but Germany is one of a number of countries that has shown the way that you can actually compete in manufacturing with high wages. Um, so our lunch is being eaten not just by China, but by high wage countries like Germany. So Germany pays significantly higher wages, as the chart shows, yet also has a double the percentage of its workforce in manufacturing compared to the US. Uh, so how does Germany do it? Um, so there's linked policies, complementary. I think there's been a discussion now in Washington, people have learned the word Fraunhofer, which is a set of very valuable institutes that help kind of cross the boundary from getting the innovation out of the lab and into the shop floor uh, at scale to be produced. But part of the reason this works is because it's linked with several other uh, pieces of, of uh, policy. So a second one is vocational training, where people, um, um, the reason that these innovations are able to be implemented is that there's a highly skilled workforce that can handle different ideas and, and change on the shop floor. So one of the policies that links the Fraunhofer with the vocational training is a program that allows or subsidizes the presence of PhD students on the shop floor in medium-sized companies. So they can take the information from the Fraunhofer uh, Institute to the firm. Why is it even interesting for a PhD student to be in these firms? Well, because they're gonna be surrounded by people with other kinds of skills. So in 2008, um, six, almost 60% of the entrants to the German labor force had an apprenticeship. So this is not just in manufacturing, this is overall. Uh, plus, on top of that, 75% of, of German workers have the right to spend five days every year in continuous improvement. They have five days that they can spend in learning to improve themselves on their job. Um, a third thing is stable access to finance. Some issues with this system now, but uh, what it has provided in the past and currently provides better than the current US system is there's a combination of a house bank system where you have specialized banks that know about manufacturing, how to value assets, and also knows the particular manufacturers that they're lending to. Uh, and then this is added to by some uh, uh, government funding, gov both national and, and uh, province level. Finally is uh, sturdy worker protections. And 
Uh, so workers uh, are almost uh, are typically unionized in Germany, and these unions have a role in deciding, making decisions about uh, production and investment as well. Um, and I think this, in general, this topic of uh, worker protections is really important. And if you think about the first three of these, you can think about these as kind of paving the high road, you know, generating these investments that are subject in many ways to these externalities where individual firms don't make them because they're not capturing them. This last one and you can think of as blocking the low road. And I think it's important for a couple reasons. One is I think as a nation we have a national goal of rebuilding the middle class. And second, it's also important for keeping this innovation machine going to make sure that firms profit by investing in innovation rather than by figuring out ways to use ever lower skill workers. Uh, so together, these policies then provide both the incentive and the capability for firms to adopt these high road solutions that strengthen long term competitiveness. Um, so in, you know, what we think is kind of as a result of our research and we discuss in the paper is that U.S. manufacturing should do the following things. It should promote high road production. It should operate at multiple levels. So the entire economy, the industry, the firm, federal, state, and local and promote this shared responsibility and also shared gains among employers, workers, unions, and government. Um, and so to conclude our answer about why does manufacturing matter, we think that manufacturing matters to the extent that it serves important national goals. It uh, already, the manufacturing that we have today, pays higher wages than average, innovates more, uh, contributes to reducing the trade deficit, contributes to our participation, our generation of a clean economy, we think the policy should um, maximize the extent to which manufacturing does that. And so we need not just sort of generic policies, but also specific policies specifically for manufacturing that promote coordinated investment. So if we think about this uh, clean energy uh, or, or uh, lightweight materials issue, we need some coordination that if I invest as a small tooling company in learning how to make tools that work with high strength steel, that there's going to be a demand for those things. Um, so, and this kind of coordinated investment needs to help things like continuous improvement, uh, the incremental innovation, it needs to help with new technologies, and needs to help with uh, developing a clean economy. Okay. Um, so, that's our presentation. Uh, I guess I'm supposed to encourage you all to tweet if you would like. Uh, and we also have some, uh, <laughs> some time to, uh, for questions. So if people uh, would like to ask questions, we have about 10 minutes. If you can state your name and affiliation. And probably what we'll do is, is collect a few questions uh, and answer them as a group. Okay. Any questions? Hmm. Waldman from, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Cliff Waldman from um, Maypod, Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. Um, I want to ask a question about what I have read and perceived to be a weakness e even in the, the novel innovation ecosystem, and that is the supposedly difficulties in the relationship between universities and industry. You often hear that in the United States with major research universities, there is a lot of... Um, friction in developing intellectual property relationships, and this is one of many things that's causing um, offshoring of R&D. Uh, universities in Asia are, are better informing um, those kinds of relationships, better, better cooperation. Can you comment on that? Great. Let, let's take a few more. I think, is it Tim, do you want to... Go ahead. Well, well, I think we'll just, well, we have a limited time. We'll just take a, two or three questions. I'd yeah. just like to hear more about the um, idea. You all hammer a lot on the wage differential, but you did mention earlier that that's been diminishing in, in these last couple of years. How, where do you see that going? And if, at, at some point, if the current trends continue, does manufacturing lose that element of its advantage as an as a economic sector? And uh, I guess maybe... Uh, Bob and uh, and and you. So they might get to, can I get. I think I think those two will have to be there. So thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, Bob Ball from the uh, AFL-CIO Industrial Union Council. I uh, just want to thank you. Um, I think your paper is terrific and is a really needed contribution. I guess my 
question or comment related to it is that it, it's really striking that you've shown sort of the myths about American manufacturing and at the same time have highlighted another country uh, that actually has a strategy. And I guess I'd like to comment more on uh, that it seems to me that most of the rest of the world actually has strategies around having manufacturing. And what you're pointing out is the failure of this country to have one at all. Um, and I'd like to have that, I think the German example provides some context for that. Karen Fireman, um, Naval Sea Systems Command. Um, I look at uh, what you have here. You have a lot of policymakers, very innovative thinkers. I like what you've said. I want to consider, have you consider the defense industrial base um, and to consider how do we change the paradigm? We are in a situation of a shrinking budget, which I consider a huge opportunity to change the rules. By changing the rules, I mean these innovative agile companies won't even consider being part of the contracting nightmare and bureaucracy that we enforce and force on, on companies and where we totally reward the ones that, as you pointed out, push down and squeeze the lower ones as opposed to becoming more innovative. So I'm looking forward to seeing from you all how do we change that paradigm? How do we change the rules, requirements, um, overhead rules, um, contracting rules, the whole, the whole horse blanket we could get rid of, um, and FICM and R&D rules and um, qualifications and testing. Great. Uh, do we, say, um, we need to? Yeah. yeah um, I think we need to move on, but well, Howard, let me, let let Howard me, answer. Let, let, let me answer and, take at least yeah. the first uh, couple of questions. So the uh, first questioner uh, is quite right that the incentives facing um, universities uh, are not, uh, in this country, are not conducive, uh, not maximally conducive to uh, pushing uh, intellectual property out into the marketplace. Universities, uh, to too great an extent, uh, have an incentive to uh, use IP licensing uh, to maximize revenues. Um, other countries do better at that. On the other hand, there are some uh, competitor countries that do much worse at that. China uh, and uh, some other low-wage countries um, uh, have basically no intellectual property uh, protections uh, worth uh, worth their salt. So whether, um, whether that problem contributes to uh, offshoring is, uh, you know, is, is a somewhat uh, difficult question to answer. On wages, um, yes, we're very concerned about the recent declines in manufacturing wages. And yes, that could erode uh, the overall manufacturing wage uh, advantage. It probably won't erode it completely. There are reasons to think that manufacturing will still offer a wage premium. Manufacturing is still more capital intensive. Manufacturers need skilled and motivated workers to keep that equipment uh, running optimally, and they're always going to be willing to pay a premium to get those uh, kinds of workers. Uh, manufacturing uh, uh, factories are still larger on average than other kinds of establishments, and so uh, you can't hire enough managers to keep an eye on all the workers in a large establishment. To some extent, uh, workers have to manage themselves, and manufacturers will pay a premium uh, to get the kinds of workers uh, who will be able to do that. So I don't think that will completely dissipate uh, the manufacturing wage advantage, uh, but it could be reduced, and that's a big concern. Yeah, maybe uh, I mean, just um, thinking on on just another approach on the on the wage differential question. I think um, one of the things that's an increasingly important part of pay packages is is benefits, and it's a little hard to sort of figure out how to value them. There's some work being done in the Commerce Department that suggests that uh, if you actually include benefits and the differential rate of benefits offered by manufacturers compared to non-manufacturers, that that uh, manufacturing wage differential is either uh, non-existent or even reversed. So it's, a, a, I think, an open question. But clearly, I think it's something that we need to uh, work on. Um, and uh, basically, we maybe segue into answering this question about the strategy. I mean, I think what, what a strategy means is that you have coordinated investments where you kind of think through 
uh, you know, for example, how you're going to create both a supply and a demand for a novel product or a trained worker. You know, if you have, uh, think about a, you know, a worker that might decide they want to in, uh, invest in training to learn how to operate computer-controlled machinery, well, if there's no such machinery in use, then they're not gonna, that investment doesn't make sense. Similar, if you're a manufacturer, you're not going to invest in that machinery if you can't find the worker. Uh, so I think that's a kind of reason why we need a strategy and that will help us build these shared assets that Peter mentioned. And so shared assets in the form of a skilled pool of workers through apprenticeships, a shared pool of suppliers that understand you know, the implicit meaning of different kinds of specifications, that understand how to work with different forms of materials. Um, these are, are very important. And I think it's not just in, to say that we want a strategy for manufacturing doesn't mean, you know, we don't also want a strategy, say, for healthcare. I mean, some of these same issues around investing in new technology and, and getting workers trained exist in healthcare, exist in service industries. Um, so, um, I say, yeah, uh, a last point then, I think, on this uh, uh, military industrial base and the contracting nightmare, I think, is not just limited to the military. I mean, I think one of the big issues in the auto industry. Uh, in fact, was their failure to adopt some of the supply chain policies uh, adopted by uh, Toyota and Honda of thinking long term about suppliers, uh, et cetera. And I hope you know we have kind of an opportunity to restart. We've seen some of that. Um, it's a combination, I think, of uh, some uh, financial issues that cause short term thinking, some incentive issues within firms, some of the investments they've made in systems that uh, help them work with such suppliers, uh, these low-wage small suppliers, as opposed to and don't really give them the benefits of, of working with these more skilled suppliers. It's a, it's a complex question and I think a very important one. So we turn now to the next part of our program, a moderated panel discussion. Um, the discussion is moderated by Rob Atkinson. Uh, Rob is the founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation and a prominent uh, policy analyst and advocate on manufacturing and innovation issues. Rob. Everybody's getting getting mic'd up here. Let me let me start. First of all, let me thank Brookings for this uh, really great uh, papers and great event. Uh, this is an uh, incredibly timely and important topic. Um, we're going to be uh, hearing sort of very briefly and, and, and somewhat more in a dialogue format today uh, from four great speakers who are issuing or presenting four reports from the Connect Innovation Institute. The reports are out there. If you haven't seen them, I really encourage you to take a look at them. Um, but before, um, let me introduce all our four speakers. I'll make a couple of quick remarks and then we'll just jump right in. Uh, so on my, immediate, um, on my immediate left is Danny Bresnitz. And um, uh, Danny is an associate professor at Georgia Tech's Institute uh, in Sam Nunn School of International Affairs. And uh, I think I've read every book you've written. So uh, I'm like a groupie. Um, <laughs> His first book, uh, and, and by the way, these are all excellent books. I encourage you to read them. Uh, his first book was Innovation in the State, Political Choice and Strategies for Growth in Israel, Taiwan, and Ireland, and a very deep analysis of what these countries uh, were doing in innovation policy. And his most recent book, which I think just came out last year, uh, The Run of the Red Queen, Government Innovation, Globalization, and Economic Growth in China, is a very perceptive analysis of the Chinese innovation policy system. And uh, I'm looking forward to his new book, which hopefully he'll send me for free, uh, since I've said now, such Now you'll get two copies. There you go. Uh, his new book with our, our colleague John Zeisman, Can Wealthy Nations Stay Rich, which was an Oxford Press. And uh, like pretty much everybody on this panel, uh, Danny got his PhD at MIT. Uh, <laughs> this is the almost all MIT panel here. Uh, 
next is Liz Reynolds. Uh, Liz is the executive director of MIT's Industrial Performance Center, which is an interdisciplinary research center looking at the uh, nexus of innovation, productivity, and competitiveness. Uh, her recent work focuses on energy innovation in the U.S. and also advanced manufacturing. Uh, before doing that, Liz was the director of the city advisory practice for the initiative for the competitive inner city. And she's also a member of the MIT Commission on Productivity and the Innovation Economy. Uh, and she also has a PhD from MIT. Uh, let's see, Erica Fuchs is, there we go, is an assistant professor of in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. And I think is our only real scientist or engineer on the panel, uh, <laughs> which I, I really enjoy and respect Erica's work because she, she brings this combination of deep knowledge of actual engineering uh, to public policy, which for at least for me, I, I kind of make up a lot of stuff and have to rely <laughs> on Erica's work. Uh, so her work has been published in a number of uh, uh, prestigious journals, High Temperature Materials and Processes, Journal of Light Wave Technology, Composite Science and Technology, and uh, International Journal of Production Economics, et cetera. And she has her PhD in MIT as well. <laughs> I detect a pattern here. Uh, and last is uh, Josh Whitford, who uh, doesn't have his PhD at MIT, but unfortunately only has a PhD from University of Wisconsin, so we'll... <laughs> We'll let that go. Yeah, fly over land. Somebody's got to come from fly over land, Somebody's right? got to do that. I understand the industrial Midwest. Absolutely. Uh, Josh is an associate professor of sociology at Columbia uh, and a faculty affiliate of the Center for Organizational Innovation. He's also the author of a book, The New Old Economy, about the implications of outsourcing for industrial policy in the U.S. Uh, also a book, uh, When Networks Fail, a book on the general theory of network failure. Uh, actually, that's a forthcoming book, and uh, Icons on the Edge, a book about the prospects and implications of the Fiat Chrysler merger. So, um, so before I start, I, you know, we heard from Howard about uh, the op-ed by Christina Romer. If you haven't read it, it's worth looking at. Uh, only for only really one reason, to understand how deeply embedded the neoclassical ideology is in Washington. Uh, this is essentially a view that says uh, manufacturing is no different than massage parlors. They're, they're just <laughs> all industries. Uh, and it sort of harkens back to the days of uh, Michael Boskin, for those of you old enough to remember this, and the Clinton-Bush campaign in 92. Michael Boskin famously said when he was chief economic advisor for President uh, George W. Bush, potato chips, computer chips, what's the difference? So I'm here today to make a bold statement. There is a fundamental difference between these two things. <laughs> when this improves and cuts in cost by half every 18 months, we get fat. <laughs> and when this does it, we get rich. So that's the difference. Uh, that's, why we, that's why we care about this stuff. So on that note, let me start with Danny. Uh, Danny, I think one of the, one of the th the, the lesson, one of the things we always hear about, why do we worry about this stuff? Because we're good at innovation in this country. We recently had an event on manufacturing policy, and somebody came up to me uh, beforehand and said, why do you, what are you guys doing on manufacturing? I thought you were eyes were about innovation. <laughs> and I'm like, well, innovation is in manufacturing, too. And there's sort of this deep view, that uh, sort of this innovation thing, and then there's this manufacturing thing. And I think what's important about your work, and including in this new report, is you talk about that we really have two systems and that our process innovation or incremental innovation system is not anywhere near as good as it should be. Can you say a little bit more about what you found and why you think that? Sure. So first of all, thanks, Brookings, and uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, and thanks, my panelists, uh, for uh, joining me on this venture. Um, and yes, we care about innovation, and I think both of us and everybody here because of its impact on economic growth. Uh, in order for innovation to help economic growth, we can't stop just in the act of inventing. We actually have to come with products and services and continuously improve them and make them cheaper. That's where innovation has its true impact on economic growth. Uh, and that's also where uh, new industries, new companies come to a forth and employ people where we just heard with higher wages. Um, in this country, 
as Peter has said, we are really, really good in novel product innovation. Yes, we should tweak it, but we should also remember we are the best in the world. And we have a whole system that support us to stay the best in the world. Where we used to be the best in the world, and now we definitely are not, is in everything that happens after the invention and maybe the first product. And Liz will also talk about this and scaling up. Um, and as Erica will say and Josh will say, this fact also impacts our ability to invent and innovate. The fact that we are no longer good in incremental and production innovation. Make it more difficult for us to come with new products because we need those skills and those capacities. Um, also, I would like to say one thing that is important in the policy orientation is that the world has changed. Our theories, and especially the way we think about policies, have not. One of the major changes of the new so-called globalization is we have fragmented production. If I've seen iPad in the crowd, the iPad is invented in California and manufactured by basically a gazillion of companies all over the world. We think about China, but even the glass is an American company. Uh, therefore, in order to make an iPad, even be able to produce it, we have to think about the whole network of companies and innovation that have to come together, sometimes extremely quickly, within three months, to enable a company, Apple, to actually come with a new product. Unfortunately, most of the way we still think about, we think about companies, one company. Instead of understanding that if we really want to compete, we have to think about subset of companies. We can call them networks, we can call them ecosystem, but we have to move them together, otherwise we won't be able to come with new products. Um, that also leads to one other part uh, of innovation which we have to think about it. We have a lot of rules for invention because we agree that it's basically a semi-public good. Uh, therefore, private companies will not invest enough in it. This is also true in every other kind of innovation. Uh, and therefore, we should think about shared assets. Uh, we should think about things like a Fraunhofer, with, if you really think what it does, it's basically provide the semi-public goods of those kind of innovation to those small uh, and medium-sized enterprises so they can become more and more uh, profitable and better. And this is, of course, one of the uh, examples we love in this country is training and labor force. And I just have to remark that one of the things we have to think about once you move to this new policy paradigm is that our labor training program usually look backward. If you look at Taiwan, which I know very well, if you even look at China, and definitely in Germany, they are back of our future looking board. What kind of workers do we need 10 years from now? Not what kind of workers we needed 10 years ago. Uh, the last thing that I want to say to open this panel is to repeat the fact that we have extremely good financial investment, organization, ideas, system to support novel product innovation. We invented the venture capital industry. We used to have a system that also was able to have the skills and the capacity and the business models to invest in production facilities and incremental and process innovation. We don't have it. I don't know how many of you remember, maybe your parents, maybe yourself, walking around with a credit card that says Chemical Bank. It's now Chase, and it lost a lot of what chemical banks knew about the chemical industry. Um, and with that, I think uh, I'll stop and let my fellow well, let me, Dan, let me ask you one quick follow-on, which is um, one of the points you make in the paper, which I think is increasingly, incredibly important, which is that the unit of intervention should not just be the firm, it should be the industry or the sector. Uh, isn't that industrial policy? <laughs> um, that's uh, an interesting question because I'm not sure what is not an industrial policy if you take this seriously. Um, 
I would say that if we care, which I think we should, about innovation and economic growth in this country, we have to realize that the way we produce both services and products, most of them by way are the same thing or combined together, and we want to excel, we have to think about a coordination problem among many different companies, especially since coordination problems, semi-public goods and collective action are things that we know companies have difficult to overcome. And the other thing is most other countries that I work with, including you know, countries that are really good in novel product innovation like Israel, have realized that and they are changing their policies. Maybe we should look around and see whether that's a smart thing to do. Great, great. So, Liz, uh, um, um, that's actually a, a setup uh, maybe for, for, for you now in the sense of you're looking in your, your study uh, at, at one particular kind of industry and, uh, and that it has unique characteristics in part that suggests perhaps some future growth in the U.S., so maybe you could say a little bit about more of that, and also with the with the, the view of that we have to think about in industries in a different way, and that they're not all all alike, and they don't all need the same policy, if you will. Right. Well, um, I'm gonna, it's a it's useful to follow Danny because I'm going to talk a little bit about the biomanufacturing industry, which is an excellent case study and a window into the type of advanced manufacturing where I think the U.S. has real strength, and at the same time. Uh, we see some dynamics going on that I think are worrisome for, uh, for us long term. So biomanufacturing is a very complex type of manufacturing. It doesn't necessarily um, bring about thoughts about the shop floor. We're trying to scale living um, organisms, and that's really difficult. And as a result, it's the kind of technology that um, involves R&D, but also M. So re research and development is happening here, and the U.S. is the leader in the world in this. But at the same time, we have to have the manufacturing very, uh, very close and in great proximity to this so that we can scale this very complex process. As a result, after uh, pioneering this industry, the US has become the leader and dominant in terms of biomanufacturing capacity in all the world. Five of the top 10 locations globally for biomanufacturing are here in the US. And that is because we have historically done the pilot manufacturing, the clinical manufacturing, and the commercial manufacturing here because it was an important process for us to scale and get right. Uh, fast forward 25 years, and what's happened, like has happened in many industries, is we've become more productive, and processes have become more standardized. Um, the standardization has meant that there's ability to move this production offshore, particularly to countries that have the talent uh, and the resources and the infrastructure to do this kind of commercial manufacturing. At the same time, there's been a lot of pressure on uh, certainly on public companies' uh, profit margins, and so they're looking for uh, ways to improve their profit margins. Uh, as a result, we see companies moving commercial production offshore. They're either doing it to head to Asia, to new markets potentially. They're doing it because there's a quid pro quo where you go to countries and they say, if you want to sell your product here, you need to have some sort of uh, manufacturing presence here. Um, but importantly, they've also been going for tax policy reasons. Uh, there is where we used to see a lot of pro the product life cycle was such that you develop your new product and over time you'd go find a low cost location. Re what we see now is, in fact, countries, companies are not heading to places that ha are necessarily low cost locations, but they're low tax locations. So uh, the U.S. is losing this commercial production to places like Ireland and Switzerland, which in fact are higher cost locations but provide significant tax benefits. And while the, the first step here is the commercial production, uh, which is, as I said, more standardized, the fact is that these countries are very aggressively interested in pulling more and more of the earlier stage production towards the R&D. And that, I think, is worrisome when it comes to our ability to innovate both on product and processes. Now, what's some of the dynamic behind this? I would uh, argue, and I think this speaks to what uh, Danny has been talking about as well, is that there are certain types of manufacturing that we are particularly good at in this country that fall, uh, um, that are at risk of this kind of dynamic. They're ones that first have a longer time horizon in their development. Uh, if you think about the complexity of some of this new advanced manufacturing where we see the mixing of medical devices and electronics or defense and biopharma, there's a complex process that takes a longer time than scaling Google or Facebook. It's going to take us over five years potentially, maybe over seven years, uh, to develop this kind of process, uh, complex process. The second part is that they're also often capital intensive. 
They're going to take hundreds of millions of dollars for us to build uh, the facilities we need to scale this production, um, either for demonstration or for commercial production. And I think we see this in uh, aspects of medical devices, biopharma, uh, as well as energy. Our financial markets, uh, or sort of our, our sort of uh, financial resources, don't necessarily support that. VCs are interested in, in uh, exiting in five to seven years. They're not interested in making those kind of long-term capital investments, uh, sorry, large capital investments. And, uh, and we also see the sort of large, largely multinationals, largely public companies interested in, not necessarily in, interested in investing in that process innovation as much as finding the low-cost location uh, and, uh, and sort of maximizing their supply chain. So they're not necessarily going to be investing in this. So what we have is a situation in which we are developing the product innovation and we're very strong also in a lot of process innovation, but we're scaling all of this someplace else. And so we're losing the benefits of that innovation to someplace else. Uh, and I think that's something we need to understand is sort of what, what's the dynamic in scaling and how can we do more of that here. The one thing I would say is that I think there are some um, you know, bright notes on the horizon, and, uh, and that is involved in the innovation itself, that we see a lot of uh, process innovation, again, where we have strengths, um, whole new areas of products and um, emerging technologies that the U.S. Is, uh, is leading in. We see a lot of innovation in business models. So, for example, in biopharma, contract manufacturing organizations that are specializing uh, in, the, in the processing side are popping up in the U.S. to support small and medium-sized innovative companies. Uh, and then we see technologies itself, niche production, um, sort of uh, trying to find, uh, shrinking a, the scale but increasing the productivity, continuous production from pilot to commercial, uh, mass customization, a whole range of ways in which um, manufacturing and advanced manufacturing is changing, and I think there's an opportunity for the U.S. So the question I think that we need to address is, we have all this innovation, how can we capture it um, at the, on the side of scaling, uh, and what kind of policies do we need to do that? Great, thanks, Liz. So, you know, one of the things you hear a lot among the apologists for not for saying we don't need to do anything is, um, you know, we're, we're good at, the, at, at, at sort of type one innovation, but yeah, it's just not us. We, we, we don't have the capability to do manufacturing anymore, so let's just ignore it. But Erica, your work really gets at this point that there's a nexus between those two things that, that is more significant than people fully understand. Do you want to explain that? Yeah, I would love to, and hopefully to play off of the tension developed here in what Danny's statements and Liz's. Uh, so first, I would just like to laud the and to celebrate this focus currently in Washington on the relationship between manufacturing and innovation. My own work shows, uh, using extensive shop floor level data, that when firms move manufacturing overseas, whereas the hot new technologies were more economically viable to produce in the United States, the reverse is true when you move to developing countries. In other words, the older technologies are cheaper to produce overseas, and the firms follow those economics. They move overseas, and they produce there the older technologies. But what I want to add, so full stop there. Just let's, you know, this is important. Where you manufacture changes what incentives you have to innovate. But if I take that then a step further, it is not true that in every single industry that I've studied, is there back in the United States a tendency to stop innovating? Right? So while those dynamics are true, those economics are true, uh, in, for example, photonic semiconductors, very, very high-end products, what you see is the firms move manufacturing overseas. If they move only assembly, they actually innovate more, not in the new technology, but in incremental manufacturing technologies back in the United States than they had otherwise. The problem is if they move everything overseas, also fabrication, which lets them do that cutting edge technology. So we need to think about, as we're thinking about policy, what do we want here? Where will the US have comparative advantage? Likewise, in the automotive industry, while the firms move overseas and abandon there the new technology, they lose an opportunity. They could have manufactured in the United States and overseas in developing East Asia or China and in Europe and leverage that to diversify their product development portfolio to become more innovative. So we need to think carefully about where we're going to focus our policy incentives, our policy programs. And that brings me to what you see across the literature historically, is that small and medium-sized enterprises that are process-based 
early stage technology. So you look at photonic semiconductors, the own uh, sort of industry that I studied, they have in the beginning, at the very bleeding edge of that technology, 3% yields. 3% of the products they put in the beginning come out the end. And the engineers are constantly down on the production line trying to figure out what's wrong. Why can't we get a product out the door? That manufacturing we need here, right? But likewise, pharmaceuticals, early stages, some of the bleeding edge technologies Liz is talking about, that likewise you have this tight, tight link between manufacturing and R&D and innovation. Chemical industry in its early years. If we look back today, semiconductors, they're not there, right? Today we can ship overseas in electronics our CAD technologies and have them send back the technology or the product that we want. But 40 years ago, that's where semiconductors was. We had very, very low yields if you look historically and we had this tight linkage between process innovation. So if I roll back, what do we do now with respect to policy? Where do we go? And for me, the, when I look at one of my two cases, at the photonic semiconductor case, what worries me is in today's environment, what's different is we can go overseas earlier. We didn't have these bleeding edge companies going overseas and abandoning new technologies in the earliest, earliest years. 20 or 30 years ago, and we do today. And the question then becomes, when I look at who went and who didn't, all of the firms that had already gone public after the dot-com bubble bursts move overseas because they need to lower costs. They need to get products out the door. And the firms that are here innovating for the next market, for taking this out of telecom to computing, to biosensors, the technologies that we need are actually still VC or government-backed firms. Um, they are in their earliest stages trying to bring this new technology to market. And those are fragile indeed. How are we going to keep these firms alive and going to make it to when just maybe three years out, we may have a need in computing to continue Moore's law to bring photonic semiconductors onto the chip. So if I look at what's happening in the innovation ecosystem more broadly with the decline of corporate R&D labs, as Danny said, the vertical disintegration of the supply chain, if we're trusting in our small and medium-sized firms now to give us that latest new technology, then the question is what, that, what are we going to do with them to support them and bring them uh, forward to the next stage? Great. Thank you, Erica. So one of the points that Christina Romer made in her piece um, was essentially sort of the same point that, that all neoclassical economists make, which was, uh, show me the market failure, because there's not going to be market failure, so unless you can prove it to me, I'm not going to support manufacturing. And one of the reasons they have are so vociferous about this view that there are no market failures is they look at the world largely as the world is made up of atomistic profit-taking firms who act alone in marketplaces. And therefore, they have all the incentives they need to do everything right. And, and Josh, your work really goes against that view, and it talks about how there are these interlinkages, these system interdependencies that fundamentally are market failures because what if one firm does is connected and related to what another firm does. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, actually, I want to pick up on uh, a couple things that, that Danny and then Peter before said, um, which it's not that market failures aren't a problem. Market failures are a problem, but when you get a fragmented production structure, which and Peter said you need an effective network structure. The word network, I use the word network a lot because when you say fragmented, you say, oh, this is a bunch of isolated firms. Actually, they have a structure, right? They are connected in networks, and the, actual, and the structure of that network can be better or worse. And we need to focus on the notion of the network failure, right? When you talk, uh, Sue talked about the Fraunhofer Institute, which is bridging and, and creating connections between industry and the delivers, uh, you know, people who deliver training and services, right? What they're actually doing is building ties, bridging, and things like that. And, you know, so, you know, we, in academic research, we'll often say, oh, what's your unit of analysis? What's your unit of analysis? And we'll say, oh, I'm studying the network. Well, there's a policy analog to that, which is the unit of initiative. When there's a tendency, you know, Danny talked about forward-looking training, right? There's a tendency to say to a tech school, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, what firms are you servicing? Because we can, we can sh you know, we can stick them on, a, on the news and defend the policy, right? Um, and, but that's backward-looking, right? They had a need, we served the need, right? And allowing the policy infrastructure to be proactive, to be forward-looking, requires having them be involved with firms, with groups of firms, 
where they're trying to bring them together and create networks and you know, create this effective network structure and you know, looking for where is the market fair, where is the market fair. Those are a problem, but we need to think about the kind of network structure we want to build. You know, Erica and Liz are talking about the connections between companies and the way they're going to have knock-on effects down the road, right? We need ways to think about how we identify and measure network structure, in, and, you know, and we, have, we have some tools for that, right? But we don't, um, then when we go to try and defend what we do, we, people say, where's the market failure? Where's the market failure? Oh, give me a public good. Um, well, sometimes the public good is in creating linkages between companies, being the sort of glue in the economy. It's hard to measure. We need to measure it better. That will help us make more effective policy. And, you know, and one of the other things in terms of manufacturing policy that is a problem in having these bridging institutions is that it, because we haven't had a strategy, many of the things we have out there in manufacturing extension partnership, <coughs> ATP, which now TIP and now is constantly tenuous, you need to be, your budget needs to be a little bit safe. If you're going to be a network partner, if you're going to be a broker, you need to be, companies need to know you're going to be around in three years, in four years, in five years to create these groups and bring those together. That's one of the big reasons for a strategy is you can't just deliver a service. You're a player in the network, and we need to be thinking about that going forward. So, you know, yes, the unit of, the unit of initiative is not just the firm. It's not just the industry. It's a part of an industry that's connected, and you want to think about those connections, and we can do things to affect, to affect those connections. Great, wonderful. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a few questions, so you should all be thinking about your own questions here, and we'll get, which we'll get to in a minute, but um, many of you may have seen the New York Times piece uh, probably three or four weeks ago about Apple and, uh, and uh, the production of the iPhone at Foxconn in, uh, in southern China. Um, which to me, I took two lessons to that. One is that our new national manufacturing strategy is essentially called blame. Um, we'll just blame people and maybe something will happen. Uh, but it was pretty clear why Apple was doing that. It was that the entire sort of supply chain had moved in. And Foxconn is a sort of huge anchor of that. They, they, there's, there's just so much capabilities there, you kind of can't be there anymore. And we have a little bit of that now, Danny, in the US, but particularly the Albany uh, nano effort, which is a really great effort in semiconductors and, and nanotechnology around semiconductors. Can you say a little bit more about that concept? Is that a viable concept that we can build upon to gain advantage? So I, I would just, before I talk about viability, I would say that what is interesting and what for me, if you read the Apple story, is, is that there was a tipping point in which, because all the new innovations, if you remember, we're talking about the new iPhone, Steve Jobs, according to the story, three months before he wanted to launch a product, said, no, plastic is bad, I need glass, and I need a completely new, different kind of glass. Three months later, you have an iPhone to be sold. That glass is an American invention. The reason it moved to China is that anyone who knew anything about how to then produce was already in China, which was not true because this is an area where I visit frequently in Xinjiang and around it, it was not true even 15 years ago. Um, and those people know it. So I go to a slightly not so pleasant place like Dongguan, and you talk with policymakers, and they said, yeah, our strategy is to capture the supply chain because as soon as we manage to capture all of the supply chain, everybody around the world start to come to produce here. And you have it in industry after industry and after industry, and if you want to come with me to China, I'll go township by township and township, and I'll tell you this is a supply chain for that product and everything around it. And yes, and I think this is exactly what Liz is talking about. The reason why Ireland and Switzerland are so hot about biopharmaceutical manufacturing is not just because of biopharmaceutical manufacturing right now. It is what they think they can build around it. And I think we actually can play the same game. As a matter of fact, there's a, probably the only guy in this panel who now is in the South. Um, <laughs> Slightly too north for my taste, it's in North Carolina, but that's what North Carolina has been doing. Their strategy was biopharmaceutical production. And they started to think 
and work with community college and all the community around them, thinking about what kind of people you need in order to be able to produce those things five years, 10 years down the road, what kind of rules you have, what kind of relationship between the universities and the industry you have to have, and not just the research university, but the technical college. And I think this is a very viable uh, strategy, and I think that we in Georgia are um, slightly envious of uh, how North Carolina managed to do that, and how San Diego, by the way, with Connect has managed to do that in high tech and biotech and uh, wireless. I wish more regions in the U.S. could do the same thing. Great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, as a Tar Heel, I think that's absolutely right. <laughs> um, so, Liz, you mentioned um, uh, how complex. Uh, Production, a process innovation can be. Uh, we visited a Merck facility up in New Jersey a couple of years ago where they were making biologics, and it was almost harder to do that than to invent the biologics. It was oh, a yeah. cancer drug. Incredibly hard to, to, to build this thing. And I asked the manager, uh, you know, did you get an R and did you, did you use that R and D? Did you apply for the R and D tax credit? And he said they didn't because the, the Treasury interprets uh, process R and D a lot more suspect than product R and D. If you're inventing a drug, you can take the R and D credit. If you're doing the process to build it, you, you have a much harder time. Uh, and then you alluded to uh, Switzerland and number number. And we just wrote a piece on patent boxes, and you, you can possibly pay. I believe in Switzerland, it's zero percent. It might be five percent of all your income from an innovation like that, you pay 5% corporate tax or possibly zero instead of 35 in the US. Today, the administration's gonna be coming out, I understand, with their corporate tax reform proposal, which I haven't read yet. I think it's being released in 12 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so my fear, though, uh, and I don't know this for sure. My fear is that, if, at least if they don't do it, there will be pressure on the Hill to sort of jettison a lot of these good innovation incentives for the goal of just flat old rate reduction. So dump the R&D credit, dump modified accelerated depreciation. Um, what's your view on all of that? How, what kind of role should the tax system play to, to do this? Well, I think um, you know, it's, um, it would be too easy for us to just say, oh, if we just reduce our corporate tax rate, you know, all of this will come back to the U.S. It's, it's not the case. Um, certainly, we have to be more competitive. OECD average corporate tax rate is in the mid-20s, and, and we need to you know, uh, make gestures, significant gestures, that show that we, we're going to compete because this is now a new tool. I mean, this is an important tool that countries are using, uh, and they're using it to great effect. But that's not actually... Um, enough in terms of uh, supporting innovation policy and innovation investments. I find it really fascinating, and it really speaks to the Connect uh, focus, that our R&D tax credit is really tied to, as we've heard from others say, it's, it's essentially a, a, a jobs program for scientists. So it, we, if we can sort of call somebody a scientist, and, and we, we sort of know what that looks like, and we can feel it in R&D, and so we can get that kind of uh, support, we don't actually understand it in process innovation. And in fact, in process innovation, we have enormous amounts of uh, R&D going on, but it may be that it's got a different uh, feel and look in terms, of, uh, in terms of workforce or in terms of other pieces. So we have to really uh, adapt and change the way we're thinking about this, because that integration between the R&D and the processing and the manufacturing is really one of our core strengths. And right now, we sort of uh, we don't play to it in any way uh, in terms of policy support. So let me just ask anybody who wants to respond. One of the things that I took away from hearing all your presentations is that this is not as simple as saying, let's just do a manufacturing strategy, and it's sort of, it's not, it's not one size fits all. And therefore, it requires, if we have a strategy that is real, it requires policymakers who have a certain level of sophistication, knowledge, and depth to figure these questions out. Uh, in my view, I'm, I'm biased because I worked at NIST, but in my view, the only agency in the federal government who can really do that across the economy, I think DOD has the capabilities within the defense supply chain, but across the economy is NIST. And it was intriguing to me, looking at the president's budget, there's a little footnote um, that says there's going to be a billion dollars <laughs> added to the NIST budget, of which uh, 200 million is wireless innovation from the spectrum. And, suggested the remainder of $800 million is going to be for a manufacturing innovation agenda, um, which to me was unbelievably great news. I, it's unclear whether it'll actually happen. But if you were advising the administration, all, all of you, you got $800 million, or maybe it turns out to $16 million. Who knows what it'll be? 
what do you do? What do you tell them we should do with that money? So I, I will start, and then um, Josh and Eric and Lise can. So I think that um, we should look at what works uh, for the high-tech innovation system. Uh, and we all claim that there's basically four building blocks. We should, which work very well for high tech, don't work that well for process innovation. And one is shared assets. So it can be in biotech, bio uh, contract manufacturing, which I admire. But it can also be shared assets for production and testing. For example, how I'm sure many of you have started to drink Argentinian wine in the last five or 10 years, and you didn't drink it before. Partly it's because one region, Mendoza, started a testing lab that improved the quality of the wine for all the companies around it, and then started the process of continuous innovation. Um, I think we have to think about, just like Josh said, how do we build effective network structure? We do it very well in the high tech. We have universities that do that. We have the VCs we do that. I can't think about an equivalent. I can think about an equivalent in Germany. I can't think about an equivalent in the US. Uh, we need flexible business model structure. Again, go to Denmark, you'll find thousands of them, from machine tooling services to anything else. It's very hard to think about how can you support that in the US. And we need to have finance. With all due respect, in order to produce and make money, one of the greatest resources that you must have is money. And we don't have the correct vehicles to channel this money to where it can take effect. Erica, you were yeah. going to offer something? Well, so if we are, or, and we are, concerned in the United States about jobs, the only place that we are going to have jobs is where we have comparative advantage. So if we believe that the place we have comparative advantage is in emerging sort of early stage process-based technologies, that has a set of implications. So first, uh, actually to Tim's earlier question on the declining uh, wage gap, if you look, for example, at photonic semiconductors, where you locate your manufacturing, the wage does not matter. It matters where you can get the highest yields, where you can get the best time, down times to be most economically viable. And so when you think about that, then that rephrases, you know, where can we have comparative advantage? Uh, and so if we're talking about what then does government do, uh, I would add uh, a couple things here. One is if we're talking about these bleeding edge technologies and that's where we have comparative advantage, uh, then we need to have government uh, representatives who have technical expertise. And I think a place like NIST is a place where that exists, uh, one. Two, we need to be able to coordinate across the supply chain, speaking to Josh's comments. We've seen empirically again and again that these fragmented supply chains, what they have problems in is long-term technology development, right? So now you say, well, wait, we don't want the jobs. We might want jobs for scientists, but we don't want jobs just for scientists. Uh, so what do we do then? Well, really, the issue here becomes, well, what models enable us to create those process jobs and those skills and process jobs if these newest technologies are constantly changing, right? If it is only five years or 10 years on this technology, and then we need to retrain workers to be able to work in that next big technology. And how do you do that? I think speaking of a semitech model is one definite way to do that. We're talking about research consortia that bring sort of companies together throughout the supply chain to do the next big thing to coordinate, but there's been other models. Semitech was just looking one to three years out. If we look at the Semiconductor Research Consortium, they're looking 10 years out on how do I create that next big thing and how do I get all the pieces in place to be ready to play there. The training of the workforce on the manufacturing and in the manufacturing skills, as well as the alignment of incentives to go to continue to be the country that not only creates the bleeding edge, but also does the manufacturing for that here, and therefore can continue to create the bleeding edge. Could, could I also sure, go some, ahead. something sure. on that? Um, I think, well, first I'll also give the, 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 the props, the same props to NIST, which is an agency I have a lot of respect for, and Erica's point that having technical expertise, technical, and expertise in, in government is important in terms of if what you're talking about is, like use my term, the mitigation network there, there you know, these are things that are not that expensive, but they're very hard to identify. And 
but one place we know that we can identify, and they're, and they're important, if you look at what other countries are doing, Liz made the point, of trying to get a supply base, what Sue has called in other work, an industrial commons, right, that has a supply base and, you know, an effective supply base that can help companies innovate in fragmented innovation. Process innovations very often require adjustment across multiple firms in a, in a supply network. They're often not chains. They're, that's why you call them a network, is they have multiple entailments like basically across production. And they have certain semi-public good properties, which is that they, serve, they are able to serve multiple companies. You can actually put up, you know, you can, you know, why, you know, why did Apple, the story about why Apple goes to China, the, the New York Times story makes this point. There's all this about getting the engineers up at, you know, you know, getting them up there right away and this huge production facility and all that stuff. And, and you know, and there's this moment of, you know, deep control over labor. But you read the whole article, this whole second half of the article is, you know, why is Foxconn there? Is it really about the workers? Could Fox, why, you know, why is Foxconn there and not in Vietnam? They're cheaper workers. And that has to do with a whole system around it, sort of a classic agglomeration st story. But a lot of agglomeration is really about getting ideas flowing. The innovation comes out of agglomeration because ideas are there and suppliers are there. So I would say you need to really recognize the importance of the intermediate places in production okay. networks. Okay. Did you want to jump just, in? Oh, just and two comments, Danny, because I'm, I'm thinking about that $800 million and wondering what they're going to do. And, Fund um, research at MIT. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually... Georgia Tech, I'm I, sorry. No, MIT uh, has enough. Yeah, <laughs> we're all one happy team. I, um, I think that... Um, I think that, So one point, comment on that is that we are very comfortable with funding R&D. And, uh, and we have, you know, if you look at the PCAS report, it's all about technology push. We're, gonna, we're just going to put these inputs into these, into these great research universities, and then we'll you know, have new technologies in manufacturing, and, and all will be well. That is actually not the case. I think the real challenge here is how we scale this uh, and, uh, and how you take it out of the lab and into our ecosystem. And so, uh, yes, more money into, into the R&D, but let's call it RDNS. Let's include some scaling there. And that speaks to the importance of the regional platform. And I think that's what this is all about in many ways, is that where can we do that? We can do that in some of our regions where we find all of the pieces here. And what I've seen in working in, uh, in a, a number of different regions is we can have the best research university and great uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, and we might even have a little uh, you know, federal R&D money but that does not connect the dots around an emerging uh, platform or technology, a new process innovation, for example, cell therapies, enormously uh, great opportunities. But right now we have uh, lots of little pieces trying to come around that. So we need to really find a, re a regional platform. And I'd also just like to say that um, I'm not sure how this plays out, but this idea of scale matters. These, these uh, large investments that companies are making in, into uh, commercial manufacturing have a lot of positive spillover effects. And right now our states compete with Germany and Singapore and other places to try and, and, uh, and get those there. And I wonder to what extent uh, we could have a federal uh, role in that. Go ahead. So I, I'll, I want 15 seconds. I'm a great believer in principal agent theory. If we have to change our policies, we must change our observable metrics that we demand from policy um, makers. Because if you are going to tell them change the policy, but you're still going to judge them about the metrics of a different policy, how many semiconductors, factory people you train today, uh, they're going to, first of all, make sure that they had the metrics right, and then think about everything else. So if we want to change policy, we have to change our observable metrics by which we judge the policy makers. So congressional pay raise is tied to manufacturing output. <laughs> so why don't we open it up to questions? Uh, I'm going to go in a lot of them. So here's my suggestion. Let's keep them short and uh, identify yourself. And not everybody has to answer every question. <laughs> uh, Scott Dimple from University of Maryland. Um, and my undergrad was from MIT. But I'm actually a Josh <laughs> Whitford rookie. So. Do, do you want to join us here? <laughs> <laughs> um, and my dissertation actually develops metrics to um, measure the, the impact of network structure on manufacturing job growth. And it picks up the, uh, the medical devices and, and mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals and so forth. But my question actually is for Josh. Um, the, the novel innovation 
uses a certain network structure that has lots of structural holes in it. Um, pro process and incremental is much more of a dense, tight, uh, clickish network. That's right. Could you discuss the differences there and maybe what some of the, the sociology is behind that? Uh, not, in a minute, not necessarily in two minutes, uh, okay. because you actually kind of nailed the main point, right? Which is that classically, the classic story around a market, around market, so oh, you've got a market failure, you need to, so that's about making sure that people can come up with an idea and not get it stolen. This is the whole problem, is people won't invest because they'll have their idea stolen, right? Uh, there are other kinds of, and there's other kinds of ideas that are not really that hard to come up with, and what you really want them to do, to do is diffuse very, very quickly. Right, so when the, some of the stories about Central Italy, right, about you know, process innovation, the industrial districts, which is that, or Marshall, when he talks about ideas being in the air, people are getting their ideas from each other. So what you really want is they're incremental. So you want somebody else's little idea, so you can come up with a little idea and give it back, right? But you got to know you're going to get it back, and so the different network structure have to, in technical terms, is lots of structural holes or not a lot of structural holes. You, you made the point, but you're really looking for things that close that don't give people opportunities to exploit brokerage. That they know lots of people, you know, this is what's called a small world network, right? But you really want information flowing quickly and you want to stop people from holding on to their idea and not sharing it. Yes. Great, thank you. All the way in the back and, then, uh, and then we'll go right here. Hi, Richard McCormick, Manufacturing News. Uh, we all know how hard it is for policies to change. What are the chances first for the policies to change to encourage the development of these networks? And what happens if they don't? So where are we now? Where are we headed if they don't? Yeah, well, um, I was going to actually point to Rob, actually, for, <laughs> for on some of this. Um, I think, I guess, this point of where, what happens if they don't, um, in my mind, is, um, as I said before, we're getting we're we're very strong on the early stage process development, uh, and we take it to a certain point, and then we've seen it head offshore. Uh, the all of the places where that's heading offshore have now, as we've seen, they've built these anchors, they've built uh, a supply chain, they've got a very strong sophistication in term in certain types of manufacturing, and the point is that they're going to start trying to move into upstream uh, toward more of that early stage innovation. And so, if we don't figure out what to do about this. Uh, I think there is a threat to our, our, um, our innovation uh, system, per se. Um, I think it's very hard for the federal government to, uh, to talk about networks uh, or to act and work with networks. So in, in, uh, in the words of um, much of what Brookings has put out here, you know, there's a whole bunch of principles we could support about flexibility and, uh, and um, decentralization, et cetera, in this process. O others, I'm sure, have more to say on this. I'm uh, going to order I saw so right here and then over here and then over here. David Johnson from a Bio Crossroads in Indiana. Um, we're an organization somewhat similar to Connect uh, and we have stressed innovation from the very beginning. We think a lot about venture capital and uh, new companies created, but we always avoid a jobs metric um, because in our state at least we've lost several hundred thousand auto manufacturing jobs. And we're very hesitant, even with biomanufacturing. We have, a, we have a whole full sector arrayed there and a lot of growth. But we get a lot of questions about can you replace job for job that's lost. And I'm wondering about the metrics that this panel and actually that this initiative is thinking about. Because when you start, I, I get the linkage of innovation to manufacturing, and I really applaud Connect and Brookings for doing that. But when you start talking about manufacturing, at least in our part of the country, to policymakers, you are talking about jobs just in sheer raw numbers. And so there's going to be, I think, a real expectation that if, in fact, they're being asked to take steps, adopt new policies, put new things in place, that we're going to suddenly see those hundreds of thousands of jobs coming back. Uh, how, how do you begin to develop a metric for thinking about the jobs that will be created in these types of networks that you're talking about in a global, uh, globally competitive economy with new industries growing. I get all okay, that, and I, and I understand it, but how, how are you going to do that? Who's going to so, take that? So um, Josh actually has an NSF study which specifically aimed to start thinking about it. So Josh? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're trying to f initially, so I guess two things. One is, um, 
look, when they want you to replace all the jobs that are, have been lost in manufacturing in the last 30 years, in a year and a half, you just have to, I mean, of course you're not going to do that, right? Um, it's incremental. And it's about improvement, and it's relative to a counterfactual. And that's just one you just have to face up to and say, like, it's relative to the counterfactual, right? Uh, but on the metrics, the kinds of things you're talking about is having a robust industry that is you know, maintaining and adding jobs a little bit at a time in supply industries. The NSF project is about trying to start measuring um, linking companies that are tied to other companies and how that relates to performance. Right, so it's government responses to network failures, and we're starting with a case study of the uh, MEP. But we don't have results yet, so please don't ask me for them. Um, give me a year and a half. Okay. Um, I think you had your hand up, and then this gentleman right over here after her. I'm Stacy Wagner. I am with the uh, NIST MEP, and I hope we do realize some of that money in the budget. I really have a very <laughs> sort of quick question that's really about an estimate on, the, on your part, since you are all experts in this. And I am very curious about if, if we had all of our wishes come true and we could begin to implement these networks and uh, support commercialization, et cetera, et cetera, how long do you think our timeline would be until we could see some real measurable success that would then drive continued growth? That's a dangerous question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it, 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 the academics here, so... Uh, no, no, I, 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 I will take it. Um, I'll take it because we actually are trying to do that through Georgia Tech. Uh, so I did the case, one of the things that I did for this project, another was a case study of Atlanta. And we discovered that the main problem for Atlanta, who come up with a lot of new innovation, including we used to lead the world in data communication before Cisco and Silicon Valley stole it, um, <laughs> is we are extremely fragmented. So we couldn't create those networks. And then we now have an initiative that try to create those networks. And when we think about, and people bring, it's public-private, so you have people that bring, give money and they demand when you have to have results. We immediately said, we hope to have some, something to show for you in about three years, much more in about five years. In 10 years, we will really know whether we're successful or not, but not in a year. So, I'm going to go with an example from Carnegie Mellon. We have a advanced battery uh, startup company at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it's a faculty came in. Uh, in five years now, he is about to put out his full-on, full-scale manufacturing line. Right now, so he will start that this summer. Right now, he has about 50 employees. Those 50 employees probably came on board within three years. So he had the invention. Three years later, he had 50 employees who are now, you know, they've got their pilot manufacturing scale line, and five years out, they're about to build a full scale line in uh, Western Pennsylvania. So that gives you one scale. I'm not going to say that's going to replicate to all scales, uh, but uh, they will now be hiring hundreds of people. Well, I'm going to ask everybody for a vote on, on so if, for example, out of miracle of miracles, we could get the neoclassical economics profession to come in and bless this initiative, and so it passes in Congress <laughs> this year, and we do everything we need to do. We get Fraunhofer's. We get a better tax policy. We do training. We expand MEP budget. We do all this stuff. When we start to really see it in the real economy, in the macro numbers and all of that, three years, five years, or 10 years, you get one vote. <laughs> Who says three? 10? All right, 10, you, <laughs> ten, 10 is list five. Well, wait, are we just seeing any numbers? No, or no, are we just large, en enough what, what, that what you'll scale notice. Of I, you'll I, notice. I will say three to five years, you, enough that you notice 10, it's rotation. All right. I, I'm, I'm going to go right with Danny. Three to yeah. five. No, 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 no. I like the three to five with ten to fruition. I think, I think that was that was nuanced. Oh, there. Yeah. It was real no, no, no. Nuanced there. Three, three to five. Something that we, something so that I'll you can be, plausibly be claim as a clue. Three yeah. and a three, half years. Three, three to five. You should have enough that it is politically viable for whoever thought. Well, that's okay. The, that's, you can make that's a, a different question. Enough to, to enough to make the case. Oh, Peter. Uh, yeah, enough to make. So that's yeah. what I think the consensus here, except for Liz, was the outlier. Uh, three to five years. Safe, yeah. playing it safe. Uh, uh, safe. Uh, we'll go right here, and then Peter, and then I think we probably need to close. This gentleman's had his hand up. Mark Brodsky, retired physicist. Uh, 
you make a lot of emphasis on building the infrastructure and creating jobs and manufacturing around high tech and that you need networks for that. Don't you think it's important ingredient of that network, which these other competitive countries have to some large extent, to have commodity, low cost, large employment base, low wage manufacturing, otherwise the whole system doesn't work. I also, on the comment earlier about one reason to do manufacturing is to reduce the trade benefits by exporting, you also reduce the trade benefit by manufacturing for domestic consumption probably just as large, and that has seemed to be ignored. Could you comment on that? Yes, I, just, uh, I, I agree with you, and I, I, uh, I wouldn't say I have any sort of sense of the actual balance there, but there's no question that um, a lot of these countries, what, they're, what, you know, what we're offshoring is um, high quality, high volume, low cost production, and there's no question why we can't do that in the U.S. P&G does 95% of their manufacturing in-house, and a good percentage of that is in the U.S. And that's you know, very sophisticated systems that are based on commodity products, but are, um, you know, but are very uh, highly innovative and, and high quality. So I think you're, you're absolutely right that that's, that's important, and we have some examples of, of how we could do that. Well, and I want to I wanna underscore the high quality aspect of what Liz is saying, and then I want to take that uh, sort of one step farther in terms of uh, if we come back to the question of where we may be able to have comparative advantage or where manufacturing may just need to be here, right? There are certain cases where transportation costs are very high and manufacturing is going to stay here. Or we have problems with, for example, that we don't have the knowledge base elsewhere, so maybe in these high quality cases. So I think we need to think about which of those can we compete in here and which are going to have to be here. Can I just real quick yeah, point? Yeah. Also, to, to be clear, low cost does not necessarily mean low wage. Um, and that's a, that's a point that Sue made. But, and the answer is uh, yes, sometimes, and that's part of why we need to understand better the structure of particular supply chains and what, what, what if you lose it, it's going to pull other industries. Absolutely, you need to think about which, what base supports other you know, stuff that you will lose. You'll lose the innovation. That's essential to figure out. Yes, more work on that is needed badly. Peter. So, uh, Rob, two comments. I'd like to say that uh, we've had a historic turning point this morning, which is that we've observed that an MIT research cluster is now a subsidiary of the University of California, San Diego. <laughs> uh, the uh, second uh, point deals with this issue of political viability, which we all understand is important for any sustained initiative. And it seems to me that's why the notion of building off of the regional cluster model for the high-tech innovation is so vital for this initiative. Because, in fact, that question of building support and belief in the, the payoff at the grassroots level in technology has come because the stakeholders at the local level are participants in designing the program and the priorities. And they see, day to day, month by month, the growth of these industries. Even though, if you looked at San Diego, which is one of the success points, it wasn't uh, 50,000 jobs in five years. But people could see the growth of the companies that they could believe in, and they had chosen. So if this process works right, the various areas around the country will identify where these clusters are, whether it's in auto components or in areas like biopharma, and start to gravitate around that and build those pieces together. And they're the basis of the support, and that's where suddenly the growth factor comes that people can understand and believe in, and the metrics are generated. Yeah, and Peter, just a point on that, you know, your, your point about politics to me is um, one, one of the things I think that's so important about what Brookings is doing here is, is, is the bringing in the state and the regional because there, there really, as far as I can tell, are not very many partisan differences between these policies at that. I, I was on a panel, I moderated a panel last year with um, Ed Rendell, then governor of Pennsylvania, uh, Tom Ridge, former governor who's a Republican, and Dick Thornburg, former governor who's a Republican, Rendell's Democrat. If I didn't know their political affiliation, I would have no clue which their political affiliation was because they were just talking in very pragmatic terms about the importance of innovation, the importance of manufacturing, training networks, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what's most frustrating, at least for me, is, and maybe Bruce, you will fix this, is why those voices are not much louder in Washington uh, because they are very good at the state level to say that we're all in this together. I, I work for a Republican governor in Rhode Island and most Democratic state in the country. We all work together to do these things. 
And we can't do this in Washington, but we've got enough models out at the state and the local and regional level. So, Bruce, I'm, I'm going to count on you in the next year to completely change the political dynamic on this uh, for, for this. OK, thank you. Thank you. So we now have to switch over to our, our uh, keynote speaker, Irvin Jacobs. So please join me in thanking a great panel this morning. Erwin Jacobs, and uh, have to confess, he's also from MIT, <laughs> and uh, got his PhD, PhD there, taught there, and then was recruited to the UC San Diego campus, where I work, and uh, was a professor for seven or eight years, but began to uh, develop some com a consulting company, Linkabit, which was acquired, and then with seven, six friends, I guess. Uh, I remember the story that we didn't know what the, where a market might be, but we knew we had a good technology. And they created a company called Qualcomm. And the rest is history, as they say. Irwin, for those of us who live in California, and I would think in the country, is iconic of why this country works. Uh, Qualcomm is barrel, a little over 25 years old. Started with seven guys over coffee. Uh, now employs 20,000 people globally. And has created enormous wealth and benefits in our region and across the country thanks to the philanthropy of the Jacobs family and their commitments. For us, he's a hands-on tech technology developer and entrepreneur who knows how to navigate markets, regulatory environment, and every day uh, in his career and now as a board member at Qualcomm is addressing the kinds of issues we've, talk we've been talking about all morning. So it's really a privilege, Erwin, that you supported us early on in this effort and that you're willing to come and share your perspective. Thank you, Mary. It's a, uh, a pleasure to be here. This uh, whole area obviously is of great interest, and of course, how do we get more jobs in the country is, is something that we need to continually focus on. What I'd like to do is go through a little bit of history, uh, my personal history in a sense, but also it gives some indication how things have changed over this last, well, 40, 50, 60 years I've been at this uh, effort. I also received a PhD at MIT, so I'm part of the group. Um, I taught there for seven years. During the period as a graduate student and on the faculty, I was a member of what's called the Research Laboratory of Electronics at MIT. And over the years that I was there, it had substantial funding from the joint services. Uh, it was such that you didn't have to write individual proposals as to what R&D you might do. The money was there. You were free to kind of work at things and then report back on what you did accomplish. And I think that kind of funding had just this huge payoff uh, as far as people that came out of that program and have gone on to develop uh, various companies. Ama Bose was another person that was there at the same time did go out to decide to then, after teaching at MIT, go out to California. And um, because of lots of requests for consulting, set up with a couple of faculty from UCLA, a consulting company called Linkabit. But very early, we decided that we did not want to be a consulting company. We wanted to do things that were very innovative to develop new products, take those products into manufacture. So we had that whole direction in mind from the very, uh, almost from the very beginning. And um, I did pursue that. For the first 10 years of Linkabit, nine to 10 years, most of the support came from the federal government, from NASA, from DARPA, from the various services. And over those years, 
there were some great advantages to working with the government. You could, if you came up with an idea, submit it and very quickly get back a response and perhaps some funding, and often the funding would come along uh, 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 as you worked, and therefore you didn't need a lot of outside funding. And so it was a way to build and grow a number of ideas. We, uh, for example, one of those was, and I won't get too much detail on, on the products, but one of those was something we called the dual modem. It was a satellite terminal based on something that later became called the risk reduced instruction set processor. Came up with the idea, had enough support from the government, it was a, kind of a whole new way of doing things to allow us to carry it through development and then actually into production. The, the latter was an interesting point. I'd went up to talk with a general uh, who was the project manager of this particular program up in Los Angeles. And for the first several minutes, he pointed out he was a project manager, that it was very critical that the project be successful, that our competitor was a very large company, had done these kind of programs often. Yes, it, um, uh, they didn't quite meet all the requirements, but, you know, uh, they've been through this before. And he paused, and I thought that was the end of things. And, uh, but then he said, but as a taxpayer, I'm going to support your going into production. And we ended up, in fact, winning all, all that production. So things were, in some sense, a little bit more flexible that, uh, back in, in those days. Um, we then switched over into uh, various commercial products. So we took a lot of the things we learned in the government side and applied them onto uh, the commercial direction. Um, one of those was, for example, a competitive program we won against a company in Georgia, in Atlanta, but um, among others, uh, to develop a scrambling system for HBO for satellite to home uh, communication. Actually, it was initially satellite to cable head, but for political reasons, it turned out you also had to provide these, that was the first time I really learned about a lot of these political issues, you had to provide a descrambler that people could use at their home because there was a whole organization of backyard dish owners that said, we, we, you know, you can't just shut us out. And so we had to develop uh, that product. And a couple of things on that. In order to develop that, we needed to uh, develop several chips so that we could have something very inexpensive. But at that time, there was no commercial software for developing chips on computers. It was all done by hand. It would have taken forever. Luckily, uh, we had been working with some research universities. MIT, Caltech was kind of the lead in all of this, University of Washington. And I had an employee actually spend a term up at Caltech to understand things better. We had brought software back with cooperation from the universities, these research universities. We're starting to do some homework problems to put the software together and develop it. But when this need came up for the home descrambler, we simply said, okay, we're going to take a chance and try to develop the chips on this brand new software. Luckily, all three chips worked, and so we suddenly had a product. Then the question was, where do you manufacture? And um, we looked around, went into these all various considerations. At that time, there was a very interesting government program. I think it had been set up for the farmer industry, but that if you manufactured in Puerto Rico, all the value added there was then going to be tax-free in the U.S. when you sold the product. So we, you follow the rules of the game when, you, when these, these uh, decisions are made. And so we set up our factory in Puerto Rico to manufacture uh, these various units. It, it turned out to be a super program. Uh, unfortunately, I then, not fortunately, I had sold the company. Uh, uh, after that was all going, I left, retired for three months. <laughs> so that wasn't much fun. And as was noted, we started Qualcomm. I might mention that in both the case of Lincoln and Qualcomm, we didn't have any product in mind. We didn't have a business plan, didn't have any spreadsheets. Uh, we knew wireless, we knew that um, digital was going to be important, and that we wanted to try to find something innovative, that is not make little steps, what can we do that make large steps in improvements? And so that was the approach that we took. 
We thought when we started Qualcomm that, again, we would be uh, probably have a number of years of government uh, program support. We did win one government project. Uh, well, we won a, a, some small ones. Um, um, the uh, SBIR program turned out to be of significant help to us. We didn't win a number of uh, uh, other small programs, but we did win one that was going on into production. It was a test range communication system, actually a fairly sophisticated system that we did the R&D and developed it, et cetera. But now it was different than the days when we did the dual modem, were able to go into manufacture ourselves. The DOD then said, okay, this has to go off of competition, uh, went to a manufacturer who didn't do R&D, didn't have therefore a high G and A level, uh, and was able to compete at a lower price. And so we realized that things, again, had changed a little bit uh, from where we were before. However, uh, we, that didn't mean we left the government business. We, we still have a part of our business uh, with the government, a uh, very important part, not from a revenue point of view, but for other reasons. Uh, but now it's more taking commercial products and adopting them to the government side rather than trying to do uh, the opposite aspect. Uh, very early on, then, we didn't have a product, but we came up with several ideas. One of them I wasn't going to mention, but I'll mention very briefly because industrial policy has come up. Uh, you might re this was the mid-'80s. We started the company in July of 85, Qualcomm. Uh, and at that time, the government was very worried about high-def television. Japan was going to was already getting close to starting commercial network, was going to take over the entire field. That field was basic uh, because of the digital aspects to computers, et cetera, and we would be left behind. And so DARPA uh, put out a, a bid for proposals for HDTV, both the transmission compression. And because uh, of our experience at uh, Linkabit, we, we bid on that, won one of, I think there were 120 teams that competed. We were very small, but we did win one of those contracts. I mention that because a little later, uh, the FCC came out with a request for commercial broadcast HDTV. And we're all set to bid this technology that we had developed when the White House came out with an industrial policy, quote unquote, that said that if you had any government investment in development, you could not use it for commercial purposes. Luckily, that didn't last too long. But uh, at that point, we could not go ahead and propose this um, HDTV. Actually, the, the video cipher product, the one I mentioned before, had been bought by uh, uh, General Instrument, and they went ahead and proposed a similar product. And that's, in fact, the direction it's all taken. And uh, the US did end up playing a very prominent role. OK, we uh, uh, then looked at some various commercial products. Uh, the idea for co-division multiple access, CDMA, uh, came up very early, actually, as part of a consulting contract we were talking about. We came up with an idea that there was a better way to do mobile communications. Didn't have the funding at that point uh, 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 to do that. Uh, instead, we developed another product for communication among the trucking industry, a satellite communication product that allowed trucks to be communicate back and forth with their headquarters, and the headquarters always know uh, the position. Th that product, by the way, we uh, first sold in uh, 88, uh, and it's still, still in significant use. And one of the things it, that it did accomplish, and I think where we may still be ahead throughout the world, is that improved the logistics of our transportation industry. And so the trucking industry and then cooperating multimodal with railroads, et cetera, uh, uh, has, in fact, ended up being very efficient when there was deregulation, which occurred about that time. Uh, uh, they were able to take advantage of new technology to improve things. And by the way, it ended up being quite an education because coming from technology, what's the economics of transportation trucking? You had to kind of learn the whole works, what software did you have to put into the logistics system? The whole thing was very interesting. In any case, after that gave us now a cash flow uh, once we sold that product, and we came back and looked at CDMA uh, for the use in the cellular industry. Um, a lot of conflicts that went on. I won't, I won't get into a lot of the, uh, the details. 
uh, as it began to uh, move ahead, uh, there was at one point an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal saying that Jacobs Hype was costing billions of dollars for customer for uh, uh, cellular companies because they were depending on this technology to be usable and uh, there was a professor at some major university that was saying it violated the laws of physics. There was a little bit of opposition as we went ahead. And I always advise people who are starting new companies and come up with an idea and try to carry that forward to uh, expect this, if it's innovative, there will be others doing things different ways, the old ways perhaps, and there will be lots of uh, objections and problems and arrows in your back. But if you keep waking up at 4 a.m. and believing that what you're doing is you're on the right track, keep pushing, and hopefully uh, uh, you'll be able to make a success out of that. In order to prove CDMA work, we had to actually develop the chips that went into phones. Uh, we had to then manufacture the phones because nobody else would do that. We had to manufacture some of the infrastructure. Uh, and so it was a very long and evolved process. So we're innovating product, but we also had to innovate a business plan. How do you end up paying for all this development? How do you keep it going? I mentioned we had some cash flow from Omnitrax, but in thinking about that, came up with the idea of licensing technology. We're developing lots of intellectual property, a lot of patents. Uh, how could we both make that payoff early, make that payoff later? And so we kind of came up with the idea of licensing manufacturers where they would pay us an upfront fee, and then should this ever be successful, we would get a royalty on each of the phones that was sold later. So it was that upfront fee that gave us the money to go and complete the R&D activities, and then we've continued that business model. Of course, now there's a very large sum coming in uh, from the royalties on phones. Uh, all third generation are based on CDMA. So those are all covered, and we take that funding, so it's kind of, again, a somewhat innovative business model, though others have followed since, uh, take that funding, do a lot of R&D to keep the industry moving ahead, the technology moving ahead very rapidly, and make use of that uh, to sell to uh, other companies, the chips and software. And let me come back on that, because there was a major strategic decision involved. We were manufacturing phones, the first network went commercial in Hong Kong, the next two in South Korea. All phones for those networks were manufactured in San Diego. So we were, in fact, manufacturing and shipping them out. But we then had a decision that we had to make. Should we continue to focus on the manufacture of the phones, or should we go and say, hey, the innovation uh, can perhaps best be done by develop, moving the technology ahead, adding all kinds of capabilities, embedding that in chips and, um, and software, and focusing on that part. So we decided to sell the, uh, um, uh, both the phone manufacturer and the infrastructure manufacturing part of our business. That actually caused us to go from about 12,000 people, and my numbers may be a little bit wrong, but roughly that, down to five or 6,000 employees. By the way, the conditions of the sales were that those employees would continue to be employed in San Diego, and that did, in fact, continue for many years. So we went down quite a bit. I might say that since then, again, based on innovating, not the manufacture of the phones and the infrastructure, but the doing the chips, software, et cetera, uh, the company is now about 23,000 people worldwide, about 75% of those based in the U.S., although that percentage will probably draw, uh, draw down a little bit because so much of the business is overseas, but still much here. And, of course, there's always a concern about are we only providing jobs for college-trained people, and by the way, I think the higher percentage of college trained, the, the better we're all going to be, particularly for these uh, incremental innovations. It's better to have uh, well-educated people thinking about those kind of things. But about 15% of our workforce, I just checked, uh, do not have a college degree. So, in fact, when you have a company, you have to cover many, many bases, and that implies employing many people. 
Well, again, our business has been based on innovation, so how do you keep innovation going when you're now at 23,000 uh, versus when it was small, you could walk the corridors and talk with everybody? And of course, that does take a lot of careful thought. How do you continue to move ahead? One of the things whenever I, I, I no longer uh, carry them out, but when I used to have employee meetings, I'd always tell everybody to think about Qualcomm, continue to think about Qualcomm, as a startup, but a startup with a very good cash flow. And so if you <laughs> came up with a good idea, in fact, we could follow it up. And so we worked very hard at bringing ideas, keeping the communication links open, uh, being able to um, uh, accomplish new things. We also have a venture capital fund that we try to provide long-term patient capital to companies that set up that have some strategic relationship. I mention that because one of those, uh, for example, uh, was developing a, tech a new technology for display devices. And um, we thought that sounded like a good thing. Uh, it was a display device that would use much less energy, uh, could have color, and in particular could be seen in bright daylight. And so we provided some venture capital, then our engineers got involved working, and we became more and more intimately involved. We finally ended up buying the company, uh, it's a product called Mirasol. And so we've gone through a fairly long development cycle. Uh, then the question is, where do you build a manufacturing plant, a foundry for making this product? And we did think about that, obviously, again, rather carefully, and decided to build that foundry in Taiwan. Why Taiwan? Well, it's something that people have talked about uh, quite a bit here. There's a, uh, for the glass industry, for the LCD industry, there's a whole ecostructure there of people that are very knowledgeable about glass, able to work the various manufacturing. This was a little bit of a change on that, but not that great a change. And so there's a lot of expertise already uh, available there. And so that played a key role in the decision. Now, I might mention one other aspect of the decision uh, that hasn't been brought up here uh, before, and that uh, has to do with tax policy. Uh, many companies that have international sales and therefore international profits uh, have large amounts of cash offshore. If one brings them back onshore, you have to pay the difference between the tax rate you paid offshore, which is usually much, much lower, and uh, the U.S. tax rate. And so that's a disincentive to bringing that cash back. On the other hand, if you make investments offshore, uh, you can use that cash. And so, uh, in a sense, that was another reason for investing uh, in Taiwan. I would not say that was the key reason, but it's, again, I think something that we uh, need to keep uh, thinking about. For example, right now, I, I believe Qualcomm has about 22 billion dollars in cash uh, available, of which 16 billion of the 22 is offshore. Um, one reason, by the way, the onshore, you can keep working down by giving dividends, by buying back stock, other ways of returning value to your shareholders, which you can't do with the offshore cash. So again, these whole issues of tax policy, uh, tax incentives, various things, end up playing critical roles in how you make these uh, various decisions. Now, I think, again, the uh, issue of trained workforce has come up. Uh, uh, despite the externality issues uh, uh, that do come up, uh, we early on have decided to try to make investments in training of our workforce here in the U.S. as well as elsewhere. This whole issue of K-12 education is a, a, a major problem that we have uh, neglected much too long. And so uh, a number of years ago, we actually have done a couple of things. One, set up a charter school system in San Diego we call High Tech High. It's now grown to five high schools, four middle schools, a couple of grade schools, and we continue to expand that. Very much project-based education. The thing I want to point out there is, and uh, I think probably some of your, your familiar with other areas where this may be uh, other charter school systems true. But despite selecting the, uh, the kids, the children, 
by lottery across all the zip codes in the city, so you, it's not an IQ test or anything, and uh, educating based on actually a little less per student than the public school systems, we're getting 100% graduation rates and going on to college, and one third of the kids going on to college are studying STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, math subjects. And so, again, working well. Part of that is because it's very much project-based education, so the kids get a lot of interacting with one another. I think a lot of the advantage, not only with the teachers, which, by the way, are hired without contract uh, and have longer work days, longer uh, work years, school years, um, that uh, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer education that it, as part of the project-based aspect, the kids kind of help, end up helping one another, and I think that does help the graduation rate. There's another project we set up actually with four schools, initially four high schools in North Carolina, um, and why it was North Carolina is a long story I won't go into, but um, where we provided smartphones five years ago initially uh, to kids in several classrooms, helped them and the teachers, et cetera, talked about curriculum, we got some other uh, university help, um, and then found some startling results. For example, there was one teacher in one high school that first year, uh, she had a class with smartphones, a class without teaching algebra one. Kids with the phones 100% passed the state exam. Without the phones, only two thirds passed the state exam. And again, we were kind of wondering what's going on there, why would that difference occur? Uh, it turned out it was social networking. Kids go home, it was 24-7 availability. Kids go home, have a problem on a homework problem, ask a parent, parent can't help. Instead, go back and uh, go on, the, on, the, on their network and check with other students. So that was kind of a start, peer-to-peer. -peer. Students that had good solutions would then go ahead and uh, video themselves using the phones and send those around. And so a year ago when I was back there, one of the teachers said that he allows the students the first half of every period to present their solutions while he works with some of the kids that are having more problems. I mentioned that. Uh, it's interesting as well, Ryan. And by the way, the FCC has now set aside funding for a two-year experiment with, I think there are 20 school districts experimenting with this use of technology in the classroom. I say that because we, again, our success in K-12 has been, could be much better. We've been talking for 20 or 30 years about uh, technology being able to make a difference. I think this decade, indeed, it's going to make a significant difference. We have to work at that, but I think it's now finally going to be the time, and part of that is devices that the kids can have 24-7 and make use of and get information, e-text, all, all kinds of potential uh, advantages coming along there. Uh, just, again, looking forward, what other areas, there are certain things I don't think we're going to get back at this point, such as manufacturing cell phones, uh, manufacturing the iPads, manufacturing uh, devices of that sort, but there's all new industries that will continue to grow uh, uh, that, in fact, will need uh, product, and one of those I keep thinking about, uh, for example, is health. Uh, M Health is telemedicine is again over this next dec decade going to make some major changes, major improvements in our health care, as well as cost reductions. This involves sensors that make various measurements uh, on the body, either remotely or as a smart bandage or perhaps even some internally. You get a lot of noise from these measurements. That gets uh, the information to be transmitted to the phone that you always carry with you. It has a huge amount of uh, processing capability, and so, um, uh, can filter that out, inform you, inform the parent, inform the hospital. So I think that's going to be a major growth area. Sensors themselves can be a major growth area. That's one that's still yet to be developed. I think we can go ahead and take advantage uh, of that. So I think all of the areas that have been discussed today by the panels, the focus on these areas is very, very important. There are government policies clearly that do make a difference, the tax policies, and in particular, the question, what would you do with that money, uh, was jokingly said, give it to R&D universities. I would not consider that a joke. I think that's a great use 
of the funding. You can't make the decisions of where, which products will in fact turn out to be best, but give it to, to faculty and students that in fact will go ahead and make that uh, difference for you. Thank you very much. I think there's some time for questions. Uh, we're running over time, but as long as there's a few people here. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Levinson with the Congressional Research Service. Uh, last I knew, uh, Qualcomm actually owned uh, almost no production facilities uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, as a matter of public policy, uh, should the government be concerned that a manufacturer doesn't actually manufacture in the sense of making things itself? Well, we actually do own some, but you're correct. Most of the facilities making the chips, we have a very lot with the largest fabulous chip manufacturer for cell phones in the world. Uh, but those are all made largely in Taiwan. We used to have some made here in the U.S. Uh, Again, I think the question is, are we increasing employment? Are we paying large wages? Uh, are we generating resources? Are we doing that in a way others may pick other paths? Are we doing that in a way that's successful? And I think the answer is yes. The company continues to grow very rapidly, grows its uh, workforce um, uh, rapidly, and uh, pays above uh, typical levels. And by the way, um, we don't try to uh, farm it out to the lowest cost bidder. Uh, even maintenance, for example, we've brought in house so that we can handle that. It's, a, it's an interesting um, uh, point uh, Mary made uh, earlier to me uh, that when you have a rapid growth of workforce, you then have people spending money in the community. I think we all know this a great multiplier on the jobs being generated. So there are different ways of doing it. I don't think there's a specific answer. Do, would it be better if we had our manufacturing here or there? Uh, if it was successful, the answer would be yes, but didn't necessarily work out that way. I might add one thing. We, I mentioned earlier that South Korea uh, was one of the, it's actually after Hong Kong, the next two places we launched CDMA. And we managed to go into South Korea, they actually adopted CDMA nationally uh, by arguing that they had almost no production in, cell, in the cellular industry at the time, that they had some high-tech manufacturing, but it was all commodity, that Japanese manufacturers got there first, and so they had to compete only in cost. Here was a chance to jump ahead. They took that, and of course now Samsung, LG, others uh, have major businesses in that direction. So government can make some of those decisions. Uh, I might add one more while I'm thinking about that. Our government did made a different decision. Uh, the FCC decided that it would not specify technology for the cellular industry. It would let the market decide. There have been people even very recently criticizing that decision, but in fact it had a huge payoff. We were able to launch, get CDMA, and now although there was competition in the second generation of cellular, all third generation is CDMA, so it gave us a huge advantage. Yes. Thank you for a, a, an inspiring talk, and perhaps thank you for the things you're doing in San Diego and elsewhere. I, I, had, I had two questions, uh, and, and both are a bit attitudinal. Um, in your distinguished career, why is it that people celebrate in Finland what Tekis did for Nokia. Why is it they celebrate in Taiwan what Itri did to set up TSMC with 130 people and Morris Chang and the money? And why is it that no one knows that Qualcomm got SBIR uh, only when it needed it? Uh, they point out not after, but yeah, you got a little big. And this, the second attitude, Noah, is we, as we were speaking earlier this morning, is you, you went to Taiwan for good business reasons because there is a superior uh, innovation ecosystem, uh, which they, they out-subsidize us on, uh, which is fine. You know, they're, they're mm -hmm. a difficult, have a difficult place on the planet. The, um, what would it take for us to do that? 
and a hard question, what would you think that when you get an R&D subsidies, not SBIRs, but some of these major programs, that the government asked if it wouldn't be nice if you put 25 or 50 percent of your production uh, onshore, recognizing we'd have to work at that, but something we could do. Right on the celebratory aspect, it's something we've worried about at the National Academy of Engineering a bit. How do you, because so few of our students now go into engineering, and if you look at the graduate schools of engineering, uh, what is it, over 50% of the students seem to be foreign, are foreign born, and, uh, and so we're just not uh, really uh, making a, enough of a point about engineering being a way to take ideas and make them very useful to humanity. It's something everybody wants to do. They don't realize that engineering is a good way to do that. Somehow we do have to make that happen. Even one of the panelists this morning talked about science, uh, scientists making the difference, but it's really scientists and engineers making that difference. So it's, it's important to get that, uh, that point uh, across. Um, how we do that better, uh, uh, it's something we keep thinking through. I think, again, there are the, the robotics contests, uh, the um, different prizes being awarded, but for example, there is no Nobel Prize in engineering, so we don't get that kind of boost in the engineering uh, side. And so these are areas that we just have to kind of keep thinking, working, et cetera. But as there's great successes in various companies, uh, certainly Facebook comes to mind, Google comes to mind, Apple for sure comes to mind, uh, Qualcomm a little less so, even though we have our name on the stadium. Uh, <laughs> and most people seem to know us. Uh, the, the consumer facing products, uh, uh, I think you get to know. And I think the success of those, in fact, are, is encouraging a lot more people to think about software as a career. There may be a slight negative, in fact, it would be a significant negative to that. If students say, hey, I don't have to get even a degree, I can go out and become a very successful business person without that degree, some can do that. I think most, we really do need that much more basic uh, education. As far as the government programs and subsidies, again, my own belief is that we need to much more strongly support research universities and institutes where a lot of the innovative ideas come from. It's innovative ideas that then launch new industries or grow existing industries. You have to keep working on it. The incremental is very, very important, but in some sense it's easier if you have the right emphasis and management uh, and you have a, a reasonably well-trained workforce. But it's coming up with the new ideas that's very, very critical, and I think a lot of that comes out of people thinking about them in the universities. I want to go back a little bit to the question I asked earlier of the panel about the government, and I want you to pretend for us that you woke up one morning and you became a government regulator and you could not not be one of those until you came up with six critical changes that you could maybe instantly or almost instantly make to make the stodgy defense industrial base into something <laughs> like Qualcomm. Well, what would they be, the six? Right. Well, one of them, if the procurement policy could go back to the way it was in the 70s, that would be a major step ahead. That was very valuable when we started Link a bit. It was very different when we started Qualcomm. Uh, the um, openness of government contracting to new ideas and to allowing commercial approaches to be used for government, I think that, that uh, can allow one uh, to go a long way. I again mentioned the our support to universities, uh, that's uh, important. Um, the step into manufacture, uh, again, on, focused on the government uh, aspects, the, the DOD, um, they now go to the lowest cost by regulation. It usually ends up in lawsuits. Things take forever. Uh, the technology doesn't get out very rapidly. Again, the previous way where we were able to, in fact, take an idea and carry that into manufacturing. And by the way, we learned a lot about it, uh, about manufacturing. Uh, that was something that was a lot easier to do previously. 
that has now become much more difficult to get the rights to what you've developed with the government funding to then carry out uh, into manufacturing. And I think that, that uh, is an important aspect. Um, the, K, the whole education system that we kind of suicidally have been reducing funding, reducing funding, reducing funding, again, that needs to be done. As far as regulations are concerned, we've benefited for some of the government regulations. For example, uh, in Europe, there was an agreement among all the governments that they could only use one technology, GSM, uh, time division multiple access technology. And that worked well for a while, but then when everybody switched to CDMA, it kind of set them back a ways. And uh, so our policy of allowing uh, any technology to be used as long as it didn't upset, uh, upset existing users, I think turned out to be a very uh, uh, positive one. Um, there are uh, clearly, and, and it, uh, uh, it varies, different regulations involving employment, et cetera. Uh, some of these need to be re-examined, looked at, simplified. But again, coming back on the government side, people often talk about the mill specs as being a negative aspect. And indeed, like everything else, you start with a good idea and then it expands and it gets watered down and made more difficult. But when we were doing uh, government manufacturing, the mill specs turned out to be great. Once you looked and understood what the key original idea was in that particular spec, made use of it, it helped us in the government manufacturing, but for example, the reliability issues, the maintainability issues, the educationalist issues that go along with new products, we've used ever since on our commercial products. So. There's pluses and minuses. I'm sure there are other, I'm not up to your full list, but other things that, that, that could come in. But I think, again, education turns out to be one of the very key ones. Tax policy that might affect where you uh, place your manufacturer, uh, some advantages there, uh, clearly that can uh, make a, a difference. Uh, tax rates, which of course are uh, a bit of con rather controversial right now. I always say I've never met an entrepreneur who, did not de who decided not to go into biz business because he might have to pay a higher tax rate later. That is just not an issue. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Um, I just want to thank Mr. Jacobs uh, and the San Diego folks um, for, for really pushing us to do this. Um, I mean, it just was a sort of a coincident events of that we were able to get Howard and Sue's paper, um, get Christina Romer to write something in the New York Times. Um, I, I want to thank Rob Atkinson again for clarifying that there's a difference between potato chips and computer chips and that manufacturing is not massage parlors. I, I, I mean, we still seem to have that problem. Uh, in the United States. We need Moneyball for manufacturing. We need new metrics. Um, there's something about the MIT manufacturing complex which is deeply disturbing to me, but that'll be a research subject for another time. I think the last piece will be Brookings will continue to do this. We'll continue to do this with Rob and his team. And I think most importantly, what we've got to do is create that network of states, cities and metropolitan areas that can innovate and experiment the way they do in our system, replicate across places as they also do in our system, and then ultimately scale up when national politics becomes more sane and sensible. So this should be a period where we're not waiting for Washington. It should be a period where we get stuff done out there in the country and then bring it back. Thank you very much.